Pod Mortem would like to thank Original Cinematic for sponsoring this week's episode. Original Cinematic is an independent production company that has made it their mission to create, produce, and promote films that are inclusive, honor women, promote the LGBTQIA community, and provide prominent positions and roles to POC actors and filmmakers, and promote the films of marginalized and underrepresented populations. These are all things that are extremely important to our podcast as well. Original Cinematic is currently accepting scripts and treatments. Both William and Zena Rush are also available via email or Zoom to discuss writing and provide input and resources to all aspiring writers, free of charge. Their information will be made available in the show notes. Original Cinematic has multiple exciting projects on the horizon. Their next film, Immersion, is slated for release in early 2024. Upcoming films, Fetish, Sweetener, and Run, and their documentary, Drag, the Most Targeted Art Form, are anticipated for 2024 releases as well. Their new award-winning film, Group, is currently on the festival circuit, and very generously, Original Cinematic will be providing a link for our patrons to screen the film on Zoom. It is truly an honor to partner with Original Cinematic, and we can't thank them enough for their contribution to our show. And now... Back to our regularly scheduled program. Salutations! Welcome to Pod Mortem. I'm Renee Hunter Vasquez, joined as always by my co host, my husband, and my brother. Hi, I'm John Paul Vasquez. Hi, I'm Travis Hunter. This week, we are recording live from a shockingly accurate dollhouse discussing the 2019 psychological horror film, The Lodge. This film is directed by Severin Fiala and Veronica Franz, and written by Fiala, Franz, and Sergio Cassi. Filmed on location and shot in chronological order, this film relies on realism to achieve its dreadful atmosphere. Dabbling in big concepts like cults, religious trauma, grief, and the trials of blended families, The Lodge utilizes a talented cast and twist to tell a chilling story. This film was requested to us by friend of the show, Danielle Pru Godet. We want to thank you for your support as well as this suggestion. This film was also the winner of our December Patreon poll, so thank you to all of our patrons who participated and voted. If you want to help us pick an episode, join us over on our Patreon at patreon.com slash thepodmortem. So, what did you guys think about The Lodge the first time you saw it? So, I don't remember exactly when we watched it. I just remember that we watched it together. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember not liking it as much. But then watching it for the show, I realized that there was things that I guess I just tuned out or I didn't even pay attention to where I was like, oh, shit, I guess I just completely missed that. Mm -hmm. Um, So the first time I watched it, I didn't really, I don't want to say I didn't care for it. I just was kind of like, what? Um, But watching it for the show kind of shed more light on things that I missed. Um, I do like it more this time, but. It's still, you know, yeah, <laughs> it's there. All right. <laughs> what an endorsement. I was going to yeah, say well, a glowing endorsement. I, know. I, um, I will be completely honest. The first time I saw this, I did not like it at all. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that the problem that I had was because of being set up with some false expectations. Okay. Every single thing that I read, everybody that suggested it to me, all the critics, everybody was like, this is the next Hereditary. Mm. Mm, Don't say that. They're like, this overlaps so much with Hereditary. Don't do that. And so it's kind of putting you in this mindset, Yeah. especially after having seen Hereditary and it being such a big film, I think the year previous, right? Mm -hmm. And so I was like, oh, that's interesting. You know, this is the new uh, whatever horror is going to be right now. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I'm all right. I'm... I'm game. Right. Uh, but this is, I think that's to kind of sell the movie incorrectly. Yeah. Because there is some, there there are a few thematic and I guess flat out uh, perspectives, we'll say. Yes. Oh, ah, okay. Mm-hmm. That are kind of similar to Hereditary. But if you put these films next to each other, there's really nothing 
Yeah. Plot wise. No. That really overlaps enough to say, oh, this film's just like Hereditary. Yeah, I would never think that. No. And after seeing it, I would have never have sold the movie that way. No. no. But um, honestly, I feel like the film has more in common in some ways with The Shining than Hereditary. I would agree with that. Oh, I thought you were going to say The Visit, but... Oh, no. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that kid won't stop rapping. Yeah, no. <laughs> he loved that movie. Don't <laughs> <laughs> lie to our listeners. <laughs> um, but I, I also read in a few interviews that there was some... Uh, influence of alfred hitchcock's rebecca oh okay which i have not seen but i know enough about it to see a few ideas here oh okay. all right all right but it's not anywhere it's not enough again i wouldn't see this and be like oh this is just like hitchcock's rebecca yeah right so it's you know i i, I love the idea of having influences of different projects but not being like a wholesale <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah you know but um no i i i think that whenever I watched this again for the show. I gained much more appreciation for it. Mm-hmm. It's still here. Here's where I'm at. The cinematography, the production design, uh, the performances. Yeah. Mm-hmm. These are all things that I'm watching and I'm like, wow, this is, you know, the atmosphere of this thing. Yeah. Yeah. Really, really good. The music even. Uh, but then there's just this believability <laughs> and, logic of decisions made by certain characters Mm -hmm. where i just feel that it doesn't ring true at all yeah and so i fall down when it comes to the way that the narrative unfolds yeah i have mixed feelings about the ending because part of me is like oh wow another part of me is like ah well yeah (laughs) you know (laughs) and so i mean it's 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 very it's it's a mixed bag but what I do enjoy, I really enjoy. Yeah. But what I don't enjoy, it's like, man, that's upsetting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and we were kind of talking off mic, and you had said in your intro, you use the correct term, Dabble? dabbling. Yeah. It dabbles in these uh, big, heavy themes. Yeah, yeah. Does not take a dip. Yeah. Does not fall through the ice. Right. Into them. Yeah. <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> um. Yeah, the first time I watched this was with you, John Paul, and I remember when it was. It was during the lockdown in 2020. All right. And um, we watched it, and we were super excited, and then we were like, oh, neither of us really liked it. Yeah. Um, and again, like like both of you said, I did like it better this time watching it um, for the show, but there are misses for me, and like... On its surface, it's a little like conflicting and confusing for me because everything that this film is, it is. It, I should love it. I should. Yeah. I should love this. This should be like a nine for me. It's not, and I'm hoping that we can kind of unpack what that is because I'm I'm a bleak bitch. I love a bleak film. <laughs> um, I love. I, I don't want to. Um, well, I said in my intro cults very fascinating there are things that i'm like i'm interested in every aspect of this Mm -hmm. familial shit like i i love watching stuff like that i love a good slow burn there's something about the execution maybe we were talking earlier maybe the timing of certain reveals that just something is not quite there for me i don't dislike this i don't think that it's a bad film by any means i think it's good Mm -hmm. For me, something is just missing. And maybe part of that is it's the like not fully committing to these themes that I find so interesting. Maybe that's part of it. Okay. And maybe it's just the fact that I found a new man in horror to fucking hate with everything <laughs> in me. There's a character in this that I fucking hate. And yeah. he's barely in the film. Yeah. Um, but like you were saying too, the performances are really great. Like everybody shines here. There's things that happen at the very beginning that made my jaw drop. I mean, that, and you know, I love a good twist. Yeah, this ha- I should I should love this film, and I don't, and it, it's it's confusing to me. That that's interesting because I am not a bleak bitch. Yeah, I, I'm more <laughs> of a silly bitch. Yeah, mm-hmm. but I, I it was there. There is what you're talking about, but I feel like after a point, it's just like it's gone. It's and yeah. then it's just like what? I don't know if, if it's maybe the pacing. I don't. I'm I'm hoping that us talking together, we can maybe 
put a finer point on it, but there's just something that doesn't work here for me, mm-hmm. I'll say. I think what was odd to me is that the pacing is really, really good up to a certain point. Yeah. yeah. And it really does fly through the runtime in a strange way until yeah. you get to that point and you're like, this is starting, it feels like almost like an epilogue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, 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 <laughs> it's odd. It's like, oh, it's weird. Okay. All right. I guess there's more to this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I did um, find it interesting when I was kind of looking up production that this was written initially by Sergio Cassi alone Mm -hmm. and the script was then or the screenplay was sold to hammer films which is wild which i was like what army hammer no right Uh, (laughs) 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 different (laughs) film cannibals right Uh, (laughs) (laughs) allegedly 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 allegedly. (laughs) um (laughs) but they offered it to Fiala and Franz, who did Goodnight Mommy. Oh, okay. And I saw in numerous interviews that they said they were getting a lot of scripts from Hollywood that involved twins. Everybody wanted them to do another movie about twins. And they were like, we don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's not all yeah. that we want to make. And so they got this. It was something different. It was something interesting. But they said that they read the script and they were like, this is not going to work. And there's a moment of a twist later in the film that we will get to. But I believe that that is where basically the movie ended. And so you talking about this feels like an epilogue that was added. They talked about (laughs) um, really witty um, dialogue gone. Like all of that is gone. And so I would really be interested to see what that original screenplay looked like. Yeah. And I wonder if that's maybe more, um, and th- this is just me personally speaking that if I would like it more, because again, on paper, this is a very Renee movie. I, I just, I-, I don't know. <laughs> so I would really be interested to see what that original story looked like. Yeah. I will say, I mean, the way that I saw it described similarly in interviews was about kind of them taking all of the fun out of it. Yes. In- intentionally. Yes. Which Why? I I think that with the themes they talk about in the film, it's probably a good idea to. Right. But at the same time, then we need to dive deeper into these themes. But that okay. part. So that makes me wonder how much of that was in that original story. I do not know. And maybe the lightheartedness, what happens later, would be more of a gut punch. I don't know. I didn't read it. <laughs> no, I don't take a full silly and give, give us a little bit. <laughs> yeah, a little, yeah, a little sprinkle. <laughs> I, I feel like, I mean, for me, it is just a matter of not really engaging as much as they could because there is some imagery that is very fascinating. Yes. Yeah. And there's a lot of things that we see that are reminiscent of things that actually have happened. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so you're like, oh, okay, I'm getting into this. But then, as we were saying a little bit ago off mic, there's so much of history that is suggested but isn't... That part. Yeah. Exactly. And I don't need to be spoon fed. Yeah. No. But there's a lot that even just a little like a line here or there could help me to understand and connect to certain people more. Yeah. And connect to this story to know exactly how this has unfolded, Mm -hmm. how people are even knowing each other. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you've you've dropped us into this really complicated dynamic. Yeah. It would just like some um, like cliff notes would be cool. (laughs) Yeah. I I understand. Might be too much to ask. You know? (laughs) Well, we know the elephant's blue. That's it. Yeah. It's like, how, That's did, it. how did we get How did we get here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, something interesting I did see in an interview is with Anthem Magazine uh, is how the, the co-directors met. Yes. Oh, okay. It's like, I've never heard a story like this, mm-hmm. but Franz hired Fiala as her babysitter when he was 13 or 14 years old. <laughs> And so he would watch her kids and then he would be paid in VHS tapes. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. And then it turned out that they had a very similar taste in film. Okay. And not just horror. Yeah. And so eventually he would go to film school. She would become a film journalist. Yeah. Yeah. And they meet up because she's talking to this old director that apparently is kind of controversial and uh, much a lot of a, a character. Okay. Mm. Okay. I don't know any of his work or anything about him, but they made a documentary about him together. Mm-hmm. And while they're making the documentary is when they start writing Goodnight Mommy to pass the time. 
Oh, shit. All right. And they're like, well, if we made this together, why don't we make this together? And yeah, then yeah. that's it. That's okay. how it took off. It, well, it was funny to me because they called themselves each half of a director. <laughs> they were like, well, we need to work together. They are so unintentionally funny. They seem like little weirdos. And I say that in a very <laughs> endearing and loving way. Um, we're weirdos. Yeah, yeah I was going to um, say. But the way that they talk... I watched so many interviews with them and whoever is interviewing them would laugh at something they say and they're like, no, we're everybody thinks that we're kidding, but we're not kidding. <laughs> <laughs> they just, uh, they're funny, uh, like on accident. But it was their idea to film on location. They're actually in a house mm-hmm. in, I believe, Montreal. It's oh, really? actually snowing. It's actually freezing. Um, and it was their idea to film all of it in chronological order. Because certain characters take on certain trajectories and they were like, we want to gradually get there together. We don't want to start, you're at a 10 and then we got to bring it down to a three, two, whatever. Okay. Everything was filmed in order, which I find fascinating. But they, more to them saying that everybody thinks that they're joking when they're being serious. <laughs> and they said when they talked to producers and they were like, we want to film on location. They were like, <laughs> no, we want to film on location <laughs> and we want to film it in order. Okay. No, we want to film it like <laughs> and they talked about um, and the actors in a lot of interviews talked about them wanting to because it's freezing. Mm-hmm. Um, the, it's a very, very cold film um, wanting to turn off all the heat for the actors so that they were actually cold. And they were like, but the unions and the insurance wouldn't let us. And it's like, well, yeah, dude. Like, yeah. Well, why? <laughs> Come on, man. You don't really need to cut open my arm. I yeah. Mean, I, I'm, I'm an actor. Yeah. I'm acting. <laughs> There's makeup, man. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they said that they wanted to do that. And they were like, that's, it's, you know, American filmmaking. Whatever. Like they were very just like in Europe, you can do that. Mm, it's right. like, um, and Riley Keough talked about, uh, they had a, a warming tent, but they had it on ice. <laughs> and so she was like, the heaters are in there, but like we're on ice. She's like, I was terrified. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They had talked a lot about, I guess, the differences of filming for um, Austrian, uh, Mm -hmm. the film industry Mm -hmm. versus the American film industry. And that was a lot of stuff that they were talking about. Um, I will say I I know this one I didn't like the first time around. The second time around I had more appreciation for. Yeah. Especially for learning about it and seeing their process and all this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I do wonder if I will have more of an appreciation when I go back and watch Goodnight Mommy because that was another one that we watched together yeah. on uh, one of our Tuesdays mm-hmm. and we were like, all right, huh. but yeah. <laughs> I, okay. I think um, maybe in a different headspace or a different uh, analytical kind of a style, we could like it more. Yeah. yeah. One thing I will say that is very shocking to me is the list that we had on Patreon for <sighs> uh, Christmas movies for this poll. Yeah. Yeah. I, this is, I, we never know what's going to be picked. Not yeah, anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> this was so shocking. This is not one that I would necessarily call a holiday staple. <laughs> 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 Now, before we get snowed in with this film, we would like to show a warning for spoilers. Podmortem is a very in-depth podcast, and in thoroughly discussing horror films, we have no choice but to spoil a thing or two. If you don't wish to be spoiled, please go watch the film, then come back and enjoy the show. If you've already seen the film or don't care about spoilers, then let's repent. The film opens with the interior of a lodge. We glide over the foyer, the kitchen, a painting of a woman with a knowing expression, who in my research I have identified as Mary. Like the Mary? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like the Jesus one. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, cool. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, we see a loaded gun set gently on a lacy tablecloth. We hear a woman calling out for someone named Mia and the laughter of children before we sweep into the living room to reveal that the lodge is a dollhouse and the inhabitants are dolls, a mother, father, and two kids. So I feel like this is where a lot of the hereditary comparisons start. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. and in, in in this vein, it's accurate. Yes. But to say this is the next hereditary, or this is like hereditary, that it's like really giving this film a disadvantage. I think. Mm-hmm. Stop. Let's stop doing that. Like, let's <laughs> just stop comparing <laughs> films to The Exorcist or Hereditary or yeah. anything like that. We'll do for Lodges what Jaws did for the yeah, Ocean. Yeah, and Jaws. Let's stop. What That's Psycho enough. did for Showers. <laughs> <laughs> it's enough. <laughs> Laura Hall, played by Alicia Silverstone, peeks her eye through the window of the dollhouse before we join her in a child's bedroom. 
Mama Bird herself. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that was weird, but she's great. <laughs> she's great. That's just, that's just interesting. Yeah, it's it interesting. Is. Everybody's yeah. got their own thing. Yeah. They do, but she's clueless. Am I right? Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, the film? Yes. Yeah. The motion yeah. picture uh, clueless. <laughs> <laughs> I was very surprised to see her here. Yeah. And I was like, she's also in um, The Killing of a Sacred Deer. Mm -hmm. And I was surprised to see her in that. <laughs> you were. Same cinematographer. Interesting. I have a little piece about him later. We'll talk about okay, it. Okay, <laughs> okay. But she continues calling out for Mia. And we stay here, looking at the room with the dark dollhouse and its white trim. We get the title in black against the open white door. The Lodge. Laura continues through the house, calling out for Aiden now, but still no one answers her. In the bathroom, she curls her lashes before stepping back to look at her reflection and swiftly crumbling into tears. She buries her head in her hands as she cries silently. We cut to a car driving down the street with a doll sticking out of the back window. The doll is pulled back inside by Mia Hall, played by Leah McHugh. She tells her brother Aiden Hall, played by Jaden Martell, to shake the doll's hand. It chapter one. Yeah. yeah. It chapter two. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> also, yes. <laughs> it's Bill. Yeah. Um, I I saw an interview with him and he said that when they approached him to do this, he said no. Really? Because he didn't only want to be seen as a horror actor. He wanted to like do everything. And this was right after it, you know, obviously uh, what, what he's known for. Yeah. So uh he said no. And the director said that they wouldn't take no for an answer. And he said that a producer that worked on it called him and was like, just watch Goodnight Mommy. Like, yeah, they're both horror, but it's different. So he watched it and he said he really liked it and he wanted to see, you know, what else that they could do. So he said yes. Huh. But I, he had initially said no. Yeah. I get that, but I just want to put out there if there are any producers listening, I will be glad to Hail! be <laughs> typecast as a horror actor. Type, yeah, typecast a bitch. That's <laughs> <laughs> but after asking Mia how she was able to get the doll an outfit that looks just like their mom's, he does as requested and shakes her hand. The arm pops out of its socket. Mia takes it back, telling him that he's lucky it can go right back in as she fixes her doll. And Aiden teases her, proposing that they see if her head can pop back on too. But Mia says no. This sets up a little like uh, quiet sadness mm -hmm. because she only took the doll that looks like her mom because she's being dropped off by her mom. Yeah. And she won't be seeing her. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a little bit of her that will be with her while her mom's gone. Well, she's yeah. not. Yeah. In the front seat, Laura drives and glances in the rearview mirror as she applies lipstick. It's very safe. Yeah. <laughs> she had one eye on the road. One eye? <laughs> <laughs> Mia's smile drops and she asks her mom, is she going to be there? When Laura tells her no, Mia calls the person in question a slur and Laura makes no move to correct her. I, was, I literally put no correction nope. or... <laughs> Like, Jesus. She's like, I'm really focused on the slips. Yeah. <laughs> I'm also trying to drive. Yeah. I need one eye on my mouth, one eye on the road. <laughs> when they pull up to the house, Laura spots a woman moving in the upstairs window and tells the kids to come on. As they get out of the car and Laura takes their bags out of the back, the kid's father, Richard Hall, played by Richard Armitage, comes down to greet them. If I'm not mistaken, I think he was in the Hobbit movies. Oh. oh, but I did see in an interview that he did with IMDb with Kevin Smith, of all people. Oh, cool. <laughs> he actually saw Goodnight Mommy and he contacted his agent and he said, whatever they do next, I don't care what the part is. I want a part in it. How oh, cool. Right. That's so, fucking yeah. awesome. Yeah. Can you imagine making one film and then hearing that somebody did that? Yeah, I would lose my mind. That is, that's <laughs> fucking cool. <laughs> But the kids are happy to see him, Mia rushing into his arms and Aiden offering him a side hug. Richard hands cash to Mia, telling her to go with her brother to get candy from the store while he talks to their mom. But before they can dash off, Laura makes Mia recite the candy restrictions. No artificial colors, gelatins or artificial sweeteners. And then they're off. I, I don't I don't know if they're going to buy fruit. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say... Um, We've met this man for a handful of seconds. Mm -hmm. 
as a father, as a husband, I already, I don't know what it was, but I was like, I just don't. Bad vibes. Yeah, I was like, I already don't like the way something about you. I'm not. <laughs> well, I wanted to know, like, I and I know it unfolds. Right, right. And we know what's going on. But the reception from Aiden was a little slight. A little bit. Yeah. And so I was like, what did he do? Yeah. I mean, I just feel in the conversation that's coming, I feel like now is not the time to do this. Mm -hmm. I feel, I mean, it's just, I don't know. Let's, let's uh, continue. They head inside and Richard leads Laura into the kitchen where he promptly puts two used wine glasses into the sink as he thanks her for bringing the kids. Laura eyes the glasses and without her having to vocalize her tension, Richard tells her that she is not here. He tells her that she looks nice as he drops an antacid into a glass of water. So I'm like, this is about to be, this is not going to be good. Yeah. He's like, my stomach already hurts. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I will say is that if you, if you drop an Alka-Seltzer into a glass mm-hmm. on a film and you don't get a close up shot, I think you get arrested. <laughs> 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 I think you're put in prison. <laughs> Because every fucking movie, yeah, I know those are just you the rules. Have to. You literally have to. You get drummed out of the union. <laughs> but as it fizzes, they stand there awkwardly. Richard offers her tea or coffee, and Laura agrees to coffee. But Richard warns her that it's just instant because he doesn't drink coffee anymore. This was very like a throwaway thing, but goddamn, mm-hmm. that is a dagger. Like, obviously, we used to drink coffee together. Now you don't drink it anymore. But here's yeah. the thing as well is that this kind of a situation, not knowing this, how much time has passed? I don't know, but I don't think it's been that long. Yeah, I don't feel like it would be that much of a gut punch if it's been time and you've stopped drinking coffee. But if we've barely been separated and it's like, oh, you don't drink coffee anymore? Nope. I think it's I think it's just weird in general because I can't imagine a life where... Not at all, not at all. Yeah, aside from that. Yeah. But I mean, also, it just, it felt like, then don't offer it to me. I mean, I don't know, like... Well, yeah, because she didn't ask for it. No. Yeah, she didn't. Do you want a glass of water? I'm drinking a glass of water. Would you like a glass yeah. of water? Yeah, yeah, You saying coffee and her being like, yeah, and him, oh, well, I don't drink it anymore. It's instant. Is that cool? Maybe he just wanted to tell her. He's like, yeah, you, want, you want some coffee? Maybe. Oh, it's too damn bad. That's yes. what, to me... I don't do that anymore. That's yeah. how I would take it. And that's why I was already like, this is very uncomfortable. But Laura looks out the window over the sink to see a woman leaving through the gate outside. We had to overlap. I don't know, dude. I, like, John Paul, I, I already fucking feel uh, some type of way about this. Well, I'm just kind of confused as to whether or not she's living here. And if she is, is he like, you have to leave because it's going to be real awkward if you're here? Like, what's the deal? I feel like you waiting until the very well, last minute to tell her to go, it puts everybody else in a bad situation but you yeah you get to spend every last second with her and then she's got to leave and then you know what i mean but now everybody else feels shitty she had to sneak out or your wife had to see her or maybe this mad dash and sneaking out is just how they go which is maybe what led to the situation in the first place what do you mean he cheated. Well, yeah. Oh, well, yeah. No, but yeah. I'm saying. I thought that was a pretty. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> no, no, no. I, I felt like that was obvious. But like the fact that even the, the kids are like, is she going to be there? It's a yeah. known thing. Like, it's just respect. Well, of course. You I'm know? agreeing. We're all yeah, agreeing. Yeah. <laughs> it's a respect thing. <laughs> God damn it. No, because I, I mean. I don't like him even, already. Even with the glasses, like, it's like he wanted her yes. to see them. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. yes. Yes. I think that's what is making me so angry Mm. because you didn't have to do any of this. No. But Laura looks back at Richard watching as he prepares the coffee and decides it's time to get down to business. She reminds him that he wanted to talk to her and he puts it plainly. He thinks it's time to finalize the divorce. Laura offers nothing but silence as he takes a gulp of his medicated water. He tells her that things just can't stay the way they are He tries to stammer out reasoning before just coming clean. He and Grace are getting married in September. Maybe this isn't the right time to say that. It's not. And the fact that you guys were a family unit and now she's leaving your children, collective your children with you and having to go home to an empty house. It's just cruel to do this right now to me. 
at a, a drop off. Yes. Yeah. Like it just feels such odd timing. Yeah. Kids, go get some candy. I'm gonna yeah. fucking break your mom's heart. Yeah. Quick. But don't. <laughs> this is weird. But don't get candy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> candy in quotes. Yeah. <laughs> get an apple or something. Go I don't get know. some raisins. <laughs> But we zoom in on Laura. She forces her expression into a smile, tells him okay, and just walks away. Richard goes after her, calling her name, but we stay with the glass of bubbling water. It's just so sad because you could just tell by the way she's getting ready and like putting on her lipstick in the car and like struggling, crying to even leave the house to come here. Mm -hmm. I feel like in her mind, this is not what was like, there was going to be a reconciliation. At some point. Yeah. Maybe this was just a phase. Yeah. I mean, that's what that's what I got out of it. Well, I mean, I guess if he's saying now that's what's difficult is the way that he is making it seem to her yeah. is that he's been talking about divorce for forever. But if he poses it that they need to talk about something and yeah. doesn't give w- one way or the other, yeah. Yeah. it maybe it is me and Grace aren't together anymore. Yeah. Uh, I made a terrible mistake. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So who knows? Yeah. Damn that. Ouch. That sucks. But back at her house, Laura meticulously organizes stacks of books on a table before sitting down in the dining room and pouring herself a glass of wine. The weather report drones in the background, warning of humidity as she takes long drinks. She unclasps her necklace before rummaging through her purse. With no warning, Laura pulls a handgun out of her bag, puts it in her mouth, and pulls the trigger. Blood spatters behind her, marring the white wall, white curtains, and a decorative cross hung behind her. Laura's lifeless body slumps in the chair, and we get shots of the empty house as the weather report continues unfazed. In Mia's dollhouse, the mother and children have fallen over. My jaw was on the floor. Yeah, turn it off. I don't want to watch Yeah. No, uh uh-uh. It was very, very shocking. Yeah. Yes, and just devastating and unflinching because you see every, I feel like in most films, like you see the wall and the blood hit the wall. Like yeah, you see something. everything. And it just happened so fast. Yes. Yeah, it happened and it's almost too realistic. Mm-hmm. Yes. You know what I mean? It just happened. It's like, fuck. I, and I, I did notice, and that was something that was from the opening that I made note of was the gun that was on the tablecloth. Mm-hmm. Mm. And I noticed that it's a different gun than the one that she uses. Yeah. And so in my mind, I'm like, oh, so we're setting up something else on top of this horrific scene. Yeah, yeah. That's like going to be... Chekhov's. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, the whole film, it's kind of waiting to see what that means as well. Mm-hmm. But um, no, I, I... And this, for me, again, when it comes to the pacing and the narrative, I'm all completely on board still. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, this is, you know tragic horrific and we have to kind of live with these characters in this moment and see what it means to everyone for Mm -hmm. sure and i mean like narratively it's shocking because it's so abrupt but like even if you zoom out just as like a person who consumes content you cast alicia silverstone in this role Mm -hmm. she's gonna be in more than 10 minutes of the movie you think like it just makes it even more shocking because like who could have seen that coming yeah and I did, this is a point to talk about as far as the cinematographer, because mm-hmm. it is kind of the connection that you just made to them obviously working previously on yeah. the other film. Mm-hmm. But there is a shot after what happens before we go into the bedroom to see the dollhouse where it's just the hallway. Mm-hmm. Yeah, There are so many shots of liminal spaces in this film Yeah, where it's a camera creeping through, creeping from where it's just like it's kind of eerie yeah and unsettling and you kind of are forced to follow the path of this camera yeah in a way that it is it kind of makes your skin crawl a little bit yeah i would even add it's a bit disorienting too because there are times where i'm like is this the dollhouse or no yes okay yeah because that happens a lot yeah but the thing about these spaces as well is that you kind of feel these transitions that the characters are going through too if you're spending a lot of time in hallways even the conversation that they had about the divorce it was a sink that seemingly was in a claustrophobic hallway yeah Yeah. so i mean that was something that i picked up on but i wanted to talk about the cinematographer he's a guy called timios bakatakis he was actually well known for working with yorgos lantimos oh well who did yeah Yeah. killing of a sacred deer quite a few he has uh poor things in theaters right now not okay not a sponsor 
Right. Yeah. <laughs> he did Dog Tooth too, right? Yes, he did. That's a fucking wild. Yeah. Film. Yeah. But they work together a lot. Uh-huh. And I saw in an interview from the London Film Festival that the two directors were actually at Cannes Film Festival whenever Killing of a Sacred Deer was premiering. And so they met him then. Oh. And I read in Kodak magazine, I believe. It's, it's, uh, I read it online, but I think they're a magazine. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, you know, Kodak. It's yeah. a film. Film company. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. All right. yeah. But um, they had met with him because of the way that he shoots films and how desperately they wanted to not shoot digital. Oh, okay, okay. And so they knew his work as far as being able to work with dark and to be able to light it in a way that it doesn't get lost. Mm-hmm. And that's something else that we experience a lot in this film. Yes. Yeah. Where they use places without light seemingly where it's just a seeming natural light and it's lit in such a way that you don't miss anything. You notice every detail. And so he's just a very adept cinematographer. He kind of talked about starting these scenes early where there's much more color. And you do notice mm, yeah. that as it starts to get colder for the characters, it starts to get colder in color too. Yeah. Uh, okay. So it's just, it's a very fascinating way to do it. And I was very glad that he was a part of this because his cinematography for me is one of the biggest positives. Yeah. Absolutely. He should have done that episode of Game of Thrones. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> or Sinister. Yeah. Or I mean, Sinister. Just... <laughs> Nay, what episode of Game um, of Thrones? <laughs> <laughs> I think my just a black yeah, screen for I was like, did I up. cancel my subscription <laughs> <laughs> without you asking? You can see me? the torch. You yeah, can, <laughs> yeah. You can vaguely see a torch. That's the taste. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but whether you like or dislike this, I think that that's undeniable. That it is a beautiful film. Yes. Yeah, and a lot of framing of the shots too. Yes. Yeah. But we cut to a church where Mia cradles the doll depicting her mother. Aiden holds her hand, his face stoic as he sits next to his father. The priest, played by Jared Atkin, offers the consolation that death is not the end, but a new beginning. He invites everyone to pray for Laura's soul and hopes that she crosses over to where she needs to go. Outside, everyone in attendance raises black balloons toward the sky in honor of Laura. Everyone except for Mia, who holds on to hers a little longer. She's tied her doll to it, and when she tries to release it, the doll weighs it back down to the ground. Sobbing, she rips the doll off and releases her balloon into the sky. We get a lingering shot of the foreboding cross above them as someone sings, Nearer my God to Thee. Very important. Very. This was hard to watch. I mean, all of this. Yeah. Even continuing to the next scene. Yeah, this was a bit of a punch to the gut. Yes. It was very beautifully shot, I will say. Yes. The symmetry of the church, the symmetry of the cross, Mm -hmm. the black balloons. Yeah. But no, it's uh, quite a heart-wrenching. It's uh, terrible. And it only gets worse. Yes. That night in her bedroom, Richard comforts Mia as she cries. He strokes her hair as she chokes out through her tears that her mom can't go to heaven. Aiden watches from the doorway, sucking on his necklace, as Richard weakly comforts Mia that no one knows where we go. But Mia lashes out at him. She tells him that he doesn't understand and yells at him to go away. So he does, taking Aiden with him as he goes. Mia holds her doll as she sobs, all alone in her room now. But just a moment later, Aiden comes in with his blanket and pillow. Wordlessly, he sets himself up on the floor next to Mia's bed and holds her hand. She grips his hand back as she continues to cry. Beyond his head, Mia has set up her dolls, the children and the father, on their knees praying to the painting of Mary. We hear hushed and indistinct whispers as it fades to black. So it was a little frightening to see this visual and to actually hear Mm -hmm. those hushed prayers. Yeah. It is the beginning of... I think of a bit of misdirection. Yeah. As far as maybe a supernatural element. Mm -hmm. Yes, I totally agree. And there are parts where it works for me and there are parts where it flat out does not work for me. Um, for reasons I can't get into yet. Yeah, (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, because right now I'm just like, who's playing with these dolls? Who's doing it? Yeah. 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 I also feel like the scene is really um important to showcase like that the dad is kind of in over his head. Yeah. Um, and the bond between the siblings, 
Uh, I saw in an interview, Jaden Martell said that the directors would take them rock climbing, swimming, skating to go eat so that they could bond together because they're playing siblings. Yeah, yeah. At the same time, Riley Keough was not invited to anything ever. Mm, She was ah. kept separate from the kids pretty much until it was time to start filming. So, I mean, I think it's it works. I really believe the relationship between the two kids. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, it was effective. Yeah. I also wanted to know more as far as these characters specifically and their concept of religion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As prevalent and as deep as it becomes, Mm -hmm. this thought that she expressed to her father. Yeah. The crucifix behind her mother. Yes. The shrine of Mary in the dollhouse Mm -hmm. and later. Was that a cross that she was wearing that she takes off? I think so. Yeah. And uh, that he was, that he had. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. In the doorway. So I, because the way that it unfolds, it, it, I don't, I don't know what to make of that. Yeah. yeah. For them. As far as like genuineness. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, <laughs> we'll explore. <laughs> we'll <talk. laughs> But we come back up inside of the dollhouse, the family of four sitting around a table with the plastic turkey at its center. Eerie music plays and we hear the echo of children's laughter. Just very quickly, the music is very atmospheric in this film. Mm -hmm. I do enjoy a lot of it. I wanted to say that the composers for this film were Danny Benzi and Sonder Urians, who did The Autopsy of Jane Doe. Oh, Oh, very nice. That's very interesting. But we get white text that reads six months later over decorative hanging turkeys. A table is set on the patio and Richard calls Aiden and Mia over to it. I will say this is the scene that cemented for me how I feel about this. Piece of shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <But we'll, laughs> OK, hold on. Well, I thought firstly, I was like, wow, he's a cool dad getting them peeking turkeys. like this. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and then it's like they're plastic. Yeah. He really <laughs> sucks, dude. He don't <laughs> tempt <laughs> me. <laughs> Give my hopes up for yeah. some fucking crispy ass. <laughs> Get some and bow buns and fucking <laughs> have a meal. This shit on and me? then you do this to us? <laughs> Worst. Fa- what's the opposite of father of the year? <laughs> <laughs> but he tells his kids that Grace will be here soon and asks how they would feel about going to the mountains again for Christmas. Aiden says that he thought Richard was working and Richard says that he is. He planned to make the drive after they got off school, then come back himself on the 25th. Aiden is confused, asking if they're just going to be up there alone. But Richard says no. He thought it would be nice for Grace to come so they could have fun with her and get to know her better. Aiden bristles at the idea and tells him no. And Richard is like, no, how come? How come? Yeah. Yeah. Now, one thing I will say again that I would like to know this passage of six months of time. Yes. Has Grace been around at all? It. I don't think. Yeah, I don't think so. I know? think that when we see Grace's face, Is the, I think it's when the kids first yeah. see Grace's face. Because that only makes his proposition even more difficult. Yeah. Dude, it fucking pisses me <laughs> off. Because it's like introducing two cats. You don't just throw the cats in a room together and then just walk off. And just pray for the best. Yeah. Yeah. You have to be patient. You need to do this on neutral terms. You need to be the mediator. Like there is so much that goes into this situation, even if their mom was still here. But that being in the mix of this dude, like how fucking insensitive can you be? Yeah. To yeah. both of them, not just the kids, but to Grace. Yeah. I'd be like, are you fucking kidding me? You are setting her up for failure. Yes. Oh, no, yeah. And even if, because later he's like, will she really want blah, blah, blah. Even if it's her idea, I'd be like, look, I thank you so much for making the effort and for wanting to do this. But listen, like, I really think I should be there. Like, the kids need some some anchor. You know, like, yeah. I, this just fucking pissed me off. And the fact that he's like, no. What, what do you mean? What do you mean, champ? It's like, <laughs> oh, where the fuck have you been? Well, you didn't let us. You got to smell through the door, the two cats. Yeah. <laughs> there was none of that. Snacks. It's a whole thing, Yeah, dude. and then yeah. you put their food bowls closer. You keep the kids in the bathroom. Incrementally. <laughs> <laughs> 
Obviously, it's more complicated than the cats, but you know what I mean. You wouldn't, you just wouldn't even do that with cats. No, and I, I just, I just think that that's the thing is that I feel and haven't even met Grace yet. Mm-hmm. Intentions for sure, but without the right implementation, it's like you know what they say about good intentions. Yeah. But Aiden tells his father that he's not going anywhere with Grace, especially not on Christmas. Richard's like, why not? <laughs> Aiden's like are you crazy Richard still does not understand he says that Grace is a part of all of their lives and it's time that Aiden and Mia got to know her Aiden asks what he means by this and Richard flat out tells him that he is going to marry Grace Aiden is visibly shocked by this news and Richard says that they were planning on telling them tonight you know they were supposed to be married last month yeah in September yeah yeah I, but then again, I, I feel like dropping the bomb on Thanksgiving again. Your timing is... No, it's terrible. Yeah. And then with what's next, he <laughs> was just... It was just... Dude. I just don't understand anything that he's trying to do. Zero. Aiden blurts out that this is all of her fault. <laughs> Richard goes, what's her fault? I swear to God. And then he's <laughs> like, what, your mom? I... Mm. I would beat him with the fucking plastic peaking turkey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so a, like Mia, get his legs. <laughs> <laughs> Just pummeling him. <laughs> uh, I think my thing again is not knowing his occupation exactly, because if he's a psychiatrist, as it is maybe mildly hinted at in a bit, could yeah. be. It could be that he's trying to get him to talk and get it to where Aiden is saying it all Mm -hmm. instead of supposing or instead of assuming it's obvious yeah but maybe that's part of you know what I mean I understand but that's really setting up for like an after school special moment where it's like (laughs) I'm not one of your patients well maybe he is a writer for a sitcom (laughs) too (laughs) and this is the only way he knows (laughs) so I saw it I saw it on family matters you gotta follow the formula (laughs) but Aiden spells it out for him Richard left their mother for a psychopath Richard asks where he got that from and Aiden reminds him she's in your books right just as Richard starts to nod the doorbell rings so he had her <laughs> that's God, the thing I just, <laughs> oh. he's like it'll be fun show up, <laughs> show up around 8 30 <laughs> The sound hits all of them. Aiden standing across the table from a guilty Richard and Mia still sitting silently. Aiden tells his father, fuck you before taking off. Understand his anger, but you just lost pumpkin pie. (laughs) (laughs) Dessert is a privilege. (laughs) Don't say fuck you to me. These kids are having sugar for the first time in their (laughs) life. It's like Rod and Todd (laughs) and they have the pixie sticks. But (laughs) Richard follows him and once they leave, Mia gets up from the table. She watches the silhouettes of her father and Grace from the window as Richard tells Grace that he's sorry, but they can't do this right now. Her response is muffled, but it sounds understanding and the two embrace. This is enough to set Mia off. She slams the front door, getting their attention as she runs away. I've decided this house is too modern for my taste. It's extremely modern. I feel it could be cold and clinical as a sense of his own detachment, maybe. I can see that. I do like the yellow door. Yeah, but I think the number was written by a robot on there. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) It's too, it's just too, I don't know. I want a more like home feel. Got it. Got it. This isn't a home, it's a house. (laughs) Later, they sit at the table on the patio eating. Mia makes a small serving of food for her doll who occupies the seat next to her. They eat in silence until Richard tells them that he has to go out again later. And then the silence takes over again. Are they eating lasagna? Yeah. And there is a video later and they're also eating lasagna in that video. So Mm. maybe it's like a like a tradition thing. I don't know. Because I thought it was, and again, this is when I realized those that the, that was not their dinner up there. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and I, I love lasagna. I'm not upset or anything. I just thought, I'm a, I'm a regular Garfield over here. But <laughs> I just uh, thought it was interesting. Well, we thought we were getting crackling skin. And, and you know, yeah. a little disappointing. <laughs> but that evening, 
Richard slips away from the ultra modern house. So yeah, <laughs> it is very modern. <laughs> The living room is empty, and I thought for a second that on the TV it was a, a still from Sleepaway Camp, mm. but you looked it up. Mm -hmm. It's apparently from the film Scream of Fear, also known as Taste of Fear. Mm. I think from 1961, it is a Hammer Films production. Very cool. Yeah, that I, I thought it was Sleepaway Camp. I did too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But at the end of a hallway, there's a dark room and Mia and Aiden's whispers are heard before the door slowly closes. In Richard's office, they are using his computer to dig up some tea. They read a news article featuring a photo of 12-year-old young Grace Marshall, played by Lola Sky Reed. We pan over bold text, which announces Grace as the sect leader's daughter and reports that she was the only survivor found amongst 39 shrouded bodies. This is when you're like, oh, fuck. Like, there's more than met the eye. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Although, again, I feel like, but this is like kind of a the mentality of Aiden and Mia at this age, because honestly, if you're reading these articles as an adult and you're looking at this, you're like, you can't blame a 12 year old kid of course yeah. not. for being indoctrinated. But as a child, they're like, well, this is who she is. And yeah. it's like, but you can't do that. But again, I feel like there is something to be said when you feel a certain way about somebody and like, they can't even breathe right in your mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, it's like that. There is no sympathy for her. Like, they they hate her mm -hmm. yeah so yeah there is no oh my god she was like a child like there is none of that like you said it's just and also as a kid nuanced thought is not really it's a little difficult it's, it's, <laughs> there's an age where it takes off i think yeah but there's a picture of one of these shrouded bodies as well as a photo of grace's father sect leader aaron marshall played by danny keogh and yeah the last name is um <laughs> Keo. He's Riley Keo's father in real <laughs> life. <laughs> and um I read in an interview that the directors did that they said that they could not find the right person to cast in this role. Mm. And they were FaceTiming with Riley Keo and she was with her father and she was like, say hi to, you know, the directors or whatever. And they were like, it's you. <laughs> 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 and I mean it works. It yeah. does. And there's a resemblance. I mean, that's her that's her father. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you can only imagine what that must do as far as yes. performance. Yeah. It really adds to like their insistence on realism, too. I didn't think about that until right now. That the is directors. True. Yeah. But Mia gasps and Aiden tells her that Grace was the only person there that didn't die by suicide. We see the entire article now. Mass cult suicide. 12 year old girl only survivor. Aiden says that she was supposed to spread their teachings to the public. Mia instructs him to keep clicking and they find a video of Aaron's teachings. He says that we will find salvation. We need to repent and wash away every sin that's been bothering us. We only need to confess, repent, and pray. The video scans his congregation hanging on his every word. He warns them that he's not the only one watching. God is waiting. And he's so impatient that he just can't wait to see their smiling faces. He implores them to join him before they begin singing Nearer My God to Thee. The footage gives way to static and suddenly we are in the handheld POV of someone going downstairs. Once down there, they walk past the shrouded victims, all lying covered on their backs, their shoes set neatly at the feet of their bodies. The person holding the camera pulls down one of the silky purple shrouds to reveal the face of a girl. Her eyes closed forever and the word sin written over the duct tape across her mouth. So we feel the Heaven's Gate Absolutely. Mm -hmm. influence on mm -hmm. this cult in this film. Yeah. With a shaking voice, Mia asks if this is real. The person pulls another one from the face of Aaron Marshall, revealing the same sentiment taped over his mouth. The person with the camera raises our view to a mirror and reveals themselves to be Grace, the same tape over her own mouth. Just then, Richard bursts through the door, scaring the hell out of both of the kids and demanding to know what they're doing in there. It's like we were buying drugs on the dark web, I swear to God. <laughs> <laughs> the dark web. <laughs> Aiden says that he was just helping Mia research something for her school project because his computer is updating. Richard accepts this and quickly changes the subject to Grace. He says that she really wants to come on the trip to get to know them. 
He tells his children that it's important to him that they give her a chance. He entices them. They'll have fun. They'll stay up all night and watch movies. He says that Grace is a terrible cook, so they'll be able to eat whatever they want. Aiden and Mia stand guiltily as Richard asks them to just give her a chance for him. Aiden stands looking back at Richard and Mia looks up at her brother for guidance. I feel like this is indicative of how much he doesn't know his children. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because they are clearly hiding something. They're very guilty. Why are you in here with the light off if you're just doing like it there? They could not look more guilty. No. And I feel like you don't know all of what they saw. So now is the time to sit them down and be like, look, really horrible stuff happened to her when she was a kid. Mm -hmm. It's not her fault. Like she did. That is a comfort. Like. Talk to your fucking kids. Yeah. And you know what's on your computer. Yes. Yeah. And again, this raises the question. Aiden saying she's in your book, right? What is he? Is he a true crime writer? Is he? What is he? Because if he's a psychologist or anything in that field, I like him even less. For, yeah. Because what that would mean. Yes. Because uh, I'm like, is he a journalist? Yeah. It would help. Yeah. To know. But like, I don't, I know that he has to leave in the middle of the night a lot for his job. <laughs> that's all i know <laughs> but we cut to the dollhouse the mother and children still toppled over as live sea monkeys squiggle around in a jar on the mantle in mia's room she and aiden play with the dollhouse before kind of ominously packing their bags and leaving this is a very important moment mm-hmm In the car, Mia has brought with her a bag of sea monkeys. She inspects them through the plastic as the car comes to a stop. Richard makes a call on his phone, and when another phone is heard ringing just outside the car, he hangs up. With a smile on his face, he announces, There she is. How loud is her ringer, dude? Very loud. (laughs) He gets out of the car and we see Grace through the window, still just a silhouette through the condensation holding a dog leash. She and Richard embrace as the children watch. The dog yaps as Richard opens the trunk to put Grace's bag inside. He sits behind the wheel and Grace gets in the passenger seat, facing away from the kids. But when Richard's phone buzzes and he leaves once again to take the call, she turns to face them. For me, again, and I'm the type of person... If we go somewhere and I don't know anybody here and you leave me, you hate me. Like, why would you do that? (laughs) This is the first time that they're meeting. Mm -hmm. You don't even introduce them. Yeah. Aiden, Mia, this is Grace. Grace, this is Aiden and Mia. We're all going to have so much fun. Da, 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 whatever. You just fucking sit there and then you leave to take a phone call. You're a piece of shit. (laughs) Like, this is this is insane. You're you literally just created the most awkward. Yes. And why can't you take this call here? Yeah. Literally, you just farted in the car and walked <laughs> out. Like this is I I was I was so mad. But we finally see Grace Marshall, played by Riley Keo, which again, um I'm sure everybody knows, but Elvis and Priscilla Presley's granddaughter. Mm-hmm. I Lisa gotta Marie mention Presley's it. Daughter. Yeah. Or people are gonna be like, Well, did you know? You know, yeah. I know, I know. <laughs> um she does great in this. She does. Mm-hmm. I remember, I can't remember what we had seen, but I was like, she looks different in everything I see her in. Yeah. She embodies so many, like, I don't know if y'all ever saw Zola. No. But um, yeah, she's a versatile bitch. I'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> I did want to talk about her casting, but I also wanted to talk about the way that she's introduced in this film. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They really hold off and keep her so hidden. Mm-hmm. It made me think of how they usually used to do in the old days with yeah. monsters in horror films where they would hold off and then there's this payoff mm-hmm. where yeah. you only get these like little slight teases. Yeah. But then you think and it's like, well, that's how the kids see her. Yes. Yeah. They okay. see her as that monster. Yeah. But um, I read in Anthem magazine that she was actually... Riley Keough, incredibly ill-prepared for her audition for this film. What happened was she got the script the night before she was supposed to meet with the directors on webcam. And partially that led them to casting her because of the way she auditioned because of how ill-prepared she was. Interesting. (laughs) They had another actress in mind who they said, they wouldn't say who it was, Yeah, but this actress was already journaling as the character. Oh, Uh, man. I'd be fucking pissed. So so she was incredibly prepared. Yeah, yeah. And apparently that was not... uh, 
what was because they said when they met her they knew yeah yeah They're like that is grace well wow. she does a great job yeah mm-hmm. she does and they did say um it was funny because in the interview franz was like and yeah you know and of course we knew that she was elvis's granddaughter and fiala is like no we didn't we actually <laughs> 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 he said that we found out later and that's what she liked is that we didn't care <laughs> and i was like well that's a that's a, big, yeah. sorry. <laughs> that's a big difference. <laughs> He's like, that's not the story we agreed yeah. on. <laughs> Just made me laugh. <laughs> but looking at each of them and holding on to her dog, Grady, played by Wally the dog, she tells them each, hi, Aiden. Hi, Mia. The children say nothing back to her. Richard gets back into the car, excited to embark on their journey together. The dog. Yep. <laughs> Dog's name is Grady. First of all. Yeah. 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 Um, they were asked, I saw in an interview, if the dog being named Grady was a um nod to the shining. Of course. Oh, okay. And they said no. Um, and then they were like, Well, the dog was named Grady in the original script, so you'd have to ask the original writer. So maybe we don't know. <laughs> all right. Like, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. That works. We get a small montage of the trip. Richard smiles at Grace as he squeezes her thigh, and Aiden sees this and looks out the window in disgust. Mia looks out her own window, both she and her doll taking in the snowy fields. Mia watches as Grace pulls down the mirror to check her nose. When Grace catches her eyes, she smiles, but Mia immediately looks away. Before long, both kids are asleep in the back seat, and it's dark. Richard stops for gas before traveling down a narrow and deserted path to the lodge. This also made me think of The Shining. Yes. Now, first of all, I did want to talk about that look in the mirror Mm -hmm. because it was uh, kind of a repeat of her mother looking in the mirror. Oh, okay. You know, kind of a reflected uh, scene there. But also, to me, it just was indicative of Grace just being a sweet person. Yeah. And uh, and I do. I want to correct something I said earlier. I said, you know, certain nuances that a kid can't grasp. I think kids can grasp nuance. I think that they're just a little blinded to uh, her. That that it's that yeah. exactly. Yeah. Like they're not open to nuance when it comes to her. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, but this shot from behind of the car at night through the trees, I was obviously, as we said, mm-hmm. reminded of The Shining. Mm-hmm. Take a shot. Take a shot. But it was very reminiscent of the shot from The Evil Dead. Oh, yeah. Yeah. When they're headed towards the cabin. Yeah. All right. So they're going to have a great time, too. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Everybody. (laughs) Join them. Yeah. (laughs) But they finally arrive at the headlights illuminating the vast and isolated house, which we can now see that Mia's dollhouse is an exact replica of. As Richard, Aiden, and Mia head inside, Gray stays behind so that Grady can pee. She looks out over the fields of snow and darkness, and there is not one house visible. So that was something I read in an interview as well that you were talking about earlier. This realism of actually finding a isolated Mm -hmm. lodge. Oh, yeah. Because they were saying that whenever they were talking to the producers initially... They were like, well, we have this place here and we can shoot it like it's isolated. Mm -hmm. And they're like, no, you don't understand. It's the feeling that you get from shooting here. Yeah, yeah. If we're actually isolated, the actors will feel differently than if there's a house right there. Mm -hmm. And so they're really, really after that level of realism. Yeah. And it works. It does. It does. But I'm like, I feel bad. Oh, well, yeah. (laughs) I read a thing that Jaden Martell was saying that... um, there was a diner that they would eat at all the time because it was the closest thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, after a certain point, they were like, we're not getting enough customers to stay open right now. So like figure it out. Oh, wow. And they would have to like try to find pizza or like go to a st- like corner store, Damn. Not, not corner store, no, but like yeah. the <laughs> store out there um, because they really are in the middle of fucking nowhere. And it really is these weather conditions. It's Jeez. snow, it's ice. I'm just like, damn dude, they're hungry <laughs> and they're cold. Yeah. They had said that um, the hotel they stayed at while they were filming was very similar to The Overlook. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess the cinematographer, he had like a movie night and he showed them all The Shining. And it was before they actually started shooting. And so it's maybe it was a little bit of an influence as far as yeah. certain things. I can't see how it is not. 
But once Grace heads inside, Richard tells her that he set up a dog bed for Grady and where their bedroom upstairs will be. After settling Grady in his bed, Grace heads up there alone, dragging her suitcase behind her as Richard shares cookies with his kids. I did want to comment on what you said as well about the dollhouse being the lodge, Mm -hmm. because that is exactly what you said about some of these shots. You're like, I don't know where we are. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just kind of lending to that eerie, unsettling, like, I don't know. And Mm -hmm. also as well, um, I don't want to give too much away, of course, but it is kind of foreshadowing for this idea of orchestration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good point. But when Grace reaches the bedroom door, the door to the room next to her silently swings open for no apparent reason. This bothered me. <laughs> and we will we can talk about it later. Why? <laughs> Once in the bedroom, Grace unpacks, carefully hiding wrapped gifts that she's brought for Aiden, Mia and Richard beneath a sweater in her drawer. She stashes a big plastic bag filled with pill bottles in the nightstand before turning on the lamp. When she does, it reveals a framed photo of Richard and Laura next to the bed. She picks it up and looks at it for a moment before hiding it, too, in the nightstand drawer. Okay. I don't know if Richard came and set this place up ahead. Mm -hmm. I kind of felt like he did because he mentioned setting up the dog bed and stuff. But even if even if not, you came in here before her. Mm hmm. There are crosses all over the walls. There's a painting of Mary in the dining room. There's a picture of you and your late wife next to the fucking bed. Yeah. It is so insensitive. I can't imagine that religious iconography would not be a trigger for her. And you know her past. It's it. I, I'm just mad. Like, I'm. I, it, he feels so thoughtless. And so, like, I love my kids. I love Grace. So, like, they got to get along. And I love the Lodge. So she's got to love the Lodge. It's like, no, it's you're not, not <laughs> worried about anybody's comfort level. Any Nothing. Well, he's worried about Grady's comfort yeah. level. <laughs> <laughs> he did get Grady Give to bed. Give that dog somewhere to sleep. Because <laughs> he's not sleeping on our bed. Because <laughs> that would make me uncomfortable. Because that's my comfort. <laughs> <laughs> it just made me so mad. But we cut to them sitting down to dinner in the dining room. Richard serves their plates and Mia leads a prayer for herself and Aiden before they dig in. But when she finishes, she shoots Grace a look. There, I mean. Yeah. Grace looks over her head at the framed painting of Mary and Mary seems to look back at Grace. They all eat in silence until Grace's nose begins to bleed. She wipes the blood away without a word, clenching the napkin in her fist. But even in that moment, you're getting more of a feeling of thoughtfulness from Mia than from Richard. Yeah, but that the look didn't look like, are you OK? It well, looked like, yeah, we fucking pray in this. Yeah. Like, <laughs> well, I'm you saying, got a problem with that. Well, well, maybe it's not a positive thought, <laughs> <laughs> but, it but it is acknowledgement. Awareness. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> in their bedroom, Grace stares at a cross hung on the wall. She indicates it when Richard asks what she's looking at and Richard tells her that it was Laura's and that he'll take them down if they bother her. But she says that they don't bother her. Richard comes over and starts to kiss her neck as she stares up at the cross before things start to get more intimate. When Richard is on top of her, Grace can't stop herself from laughing loudly. Richard gently tries to quiet her and cautions that if she doesn't stop, she'll make her nose bleed. She assures him that she's okay and they get back to business. In Mia and Aiden's room, right next door, they hear the laughing and their father's hushed voice. Aiden tosses and turns and Mia covers her ears. You're really doing this on the first night? I, <laughs> uh, I, I, was, I was mad. I was mad. And he's initiating. Yeah. Yeah. Even downstairs in his bed, Grady is like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> But he suddenly turns and growls at nothing as we get more shots of the still house. See, and again, I do love these kind of creeping shots of the camera through the house. Yes. It continues that theme that we were talking about earlier through these liminal spaces. Mm -hmm. But I also, again, it feels, especially with the growling of the dog at nothing, we are setting up something. Yes. But, I mean, you know, I don't know if maybe the dog is growling at something and we just don't see it because the camera's on the dog, but it's setting up something later that might yes. be a little more logical. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. 
But I think the dog's just like, be respectful. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Jesus <laughs> Christ. Your kids are still awake. <laughs> <laughs> you share a wall. <laughs> But the next morning, Grace watches from the window as Richard shovels snow while the kids ice skate. Telling Grady to stay, she puts on her own skates and carefully makes her way to the ice. Mia and Aiden are having a blast, screaming and laughing and chasing each other. When Richard sees Grace struggling, using two sticks to help herself walk, he asks if she needs a hand. When she says that she does, he tells his kids to go over and help her. I... It's just beyond the kids go over to her the smiles disappearing from their faces and aiden lets her know that she's wearing their mom's hat grace immediately takes it off and hands it over to them apologizing and telling them that she didn't know mia snatches the red hat from her hands without a word and they just skate away i thought they were gonna help her and she even apologized she didn't know she didn't That's what I'm saying is he's really setting her up for failure. Yes. Yeah. Giving me this hat, trying to do it with me in the night. This is <laughs> unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> we are no longer friends. Yeah. <laughs> Richard comes over and she whispers to him that she really didn't know that that was their mom's hat. But Richard places his own on her head and kisses her cheek, telling her that it's okay. These things keep happening and he's very much like, pfft, like it's no big deal. But like it is a very big deal. It is. To your kids and to the relationship that you want your kids to have with your partner. It reminds yeah. me of The Sims where you get the negative things about Absolutely. the head. Absolutely. That's every interaction so far. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's been the red negative. <laughs> he picks up the shovel and invites Grace to grab onto it. When she does, he pulls her along the ice. Later, Mia is sliding her doll along the ice, ignoring Grace as she calls out to her multiple times to be careful. She warns her of a fishing hole, but Mia pays literally no mind to her and pushes the doll directly into the hole. Grace sprints over to her, telling her not to move any further because it's dangerous. Instead, she offers to go get the doll herself. But when she starts to crawl forward, the ice gives way and the fishing hole expands. Grace falls in. She tries to pull herself out, but more and more of the ice is breaking under her grasp. Richard runs over, and as he's pulling her out, Mia goes, my doll! Yeah. Oh, my God. (laughs) (laughs) It was was at this moment when she was screaming for her father that I was like, oh, so at least they care if Grace dies or not. But then she's like, dad, (laughs) my doll! (laughs) It's like, are you kidding me? She doesn't. She doesn't. No. He finally pulls Grace free, and when she inadvertently drags the doll out with her, Mia scoops it up. Richard tells the kids to go back to the house, and they do, Mia cradling her doll with its blue jacket and red hat. So this moment and this shot, you're Mm -hmm. like, oh, so there's a spirit in the doll. Mm -hmm. It made this happen. Anyway. (laughs) (laughs) We get gliding shots of the inside of the dollhouse and Mia tells her doll not to worry because she'll be warm soon. For a moment, the way that her voice is done, I thought she was telling Grace, don't worry, you'll be warm soon. Mm. She's not. No. She's like, Mr. Honey Bunny. (laughs) 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 We cut back to the lodge where Grace warms herself in front of the fireplace. Richard brings her something hot to drink. She stares into the fire and he leaves to go get her something to eat. She listens as he takes a phone call in the other room, telling the person on the other end to get someone to cover for him because he won't be able to come back tonight due to an emergency. Grace goes upstairs and takes a pill. Shortly after, Richard comes in to ask again if she's okay. He tells her that he doesn't think it's a good idea to go back to the city tonight. He doesn't want to leave her alone with the kids if she's not feeling up to it. But Grace insists that she's fine. This was all her idea and she'll be fine for a couple days. When Richard asks if she's sure, she jokes that she is as long as she doesn't have to go ice skating. The whole conversation, Grace has the prescription bottle hidden behind her back. Now, to me, I don't think he should be like, I won't go if you're not feeling up to it. Mm hmm. I won't go. I should be here. Period. Mm-hmm. Like, I, it's just like the framing of it. It's almost like if I don't go, it's it's your, it's your fault. Like, basically, right? 
yeah. you're not feeling up to it so i guess i'll stay when if you could get out of it that easily why don't you just fucking stay well you had already told your kids that you would be here through the 25th anyway yeah yeah so i mean it's not that so i just i mean i don't understand any of his any anything yeah. no but richard invites her over to the closet where he takes down a safe after punching in the combination one, two, three, four, five. Jesus Christ! It opens <laughs> to reveal a gun. That pissed me off too. That's that's wild. You have kids in the house. Yeah. <sighs> but he tells her that it's a family heirloom, having belonged to Laura's dad. Uh, and again, I'm sorry, but if you are you you're telling me that we are out in this secluded lodge, mm-hmm. and I'm gonna leave for two days. And because I'm leaving, you need to know how to use this gun. What the hell what? is that? Yeah. yeah. Are there like bears out? Like what? What? What's the? I don't know <laughs> what the implication is. And this, I will say, is where I was like, oh, there is Chekhov's gun. Mm-hmm. Okay. And yeah. And I was like, holy shit. And then I'm just worried even more now. Yes. They go outside where he tells her how to shoot the gun. He asks if she wants to give it a try and she takes it from him without a word, firing into a nearby tree multiple times, hitting her mark and reloading like a pro. He's like, good. It's like, what? <laughs> Later, they all say goodbye to Richard as he leaves, telling them not to go hunting for Christmas presents and to be nice. He'll be back in a couple days. He drives away, and by the time Grace turns back around from watching his car take the corner, the kids have already gone inside. But Grace knocks on the door of their room and invites them to help decorate the house with her. When they don't respond, she tries the doorknob and finds that they locked the door. Downstairs, she pulls decorations from a box. One is a Santa Claus that plays Christmas music. He holds a candle under his white beard and moves slightly as the music plays. He's creepy. Yeah. <laughs> that Santa's clearly haunted. Yeah. <laughs> Later, Mia sits by the window looking at her jar of sea monkeys. And as Grace rummages through the boxes of decorations, she asks Mia what she wants for Christmas. Mia answers her. She wants a dog. Grace goes over and sits next to her, confiding that she always wanted a dog for Christmas, too, when she was a kid. But she never got one. Mia asks why, and Grace said that she didn't get presents at all because her dad was very serious about the Bible, and they don't mention presents in the Bible. Mia says that that's weird, and Grace agrees. That is not true. Because <laughs> oh, yeah, Jesus, Jesus got gifts. <laughs> yeah, that's what... <laughs> like three, I think. It's like, Dad, you're a liar. Well, yeah, <laughs> that should have been their first sign. <laughs> <laughs> but she's she's being honest with her. Yes. Uh, so I do like that not only made me feel more comfortable, I feel like as this child, yeah. I would have been like, oh, so you have problems with your father as well. Right. Yeah. So maybe I can talk to you or maybe whatever. It's that connection. Yeah. It is. And the fact that you know what she grew up in and she's being honest about that. Mm hmm. I thought, and I was kind of watching this just as like, oh, they're having a conversation. Yeah. yeah. I well, was very happy. I yeah, was yeah. surprised that she answered her. Yeah. After she went after her doll <laughs> when she almost drowned in the lake. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not even a thank you. No, nothing. <laughs> but the conversation starts to flatline and Grace tries to resuscitate it, asking what kind of dogs Mia likes. Mia admits that she likes bulldogs, but her dad doesn't want her to get a dog either. He doesn't think she'll take care of it. Grace says that maybe if Mia takes good care of her sea monkeys, that'll show her dad that she can take care of a dog. She says that she got Grady as a present to herself. It was when she was able to put everything behind her. Grady was her new life. Mia looks down at Grace's hands and spots a small cross scarred into her palm. With a grin, she asks Grace if she wants to see the present she made for her dad. Grace says yes, and Mia pops in a DVD. It's a montage of home videos of Mia, Aiden, Richard, and Laura. During Thanksgiving, Laura asks Aiden what he's thankful for, and we watch Grace's flat expression as Aiden tells her that he's thankful for his mom. On the TV, Laura turns to Richard behind the camera and in a voice dripping with pride and love, she tells him that they did good. This is more than Grace can take and she gets up and walks away. 
The video continues to play as Grace sits alone on a couch in another room. This was kind of devastating because you think for a second that she's making progress with Mia. Mm -hmm. And then just on the heels of her kind of being vulnerable with her and then her seeing that scar in her hand, she's still like, hey, want to see this? It's it's upsetting because at the same time you're having to deal with this idea of Mia obviously still grieving her mother. Of mm-hmm. course. This gift being a gift and maybe you you start to think maybe it is she's trying to share with yeah. uh Grace. But then it's like also, I mean you 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 know it's just it's too it's complicated. And this is what made me think that this the separation has not been that long because Mia and Aiden look exactly the same. What I took from it was that this was from last Christmas Mm -hmm. or I guess last Thanksgiving. So about a year ago. Right. But I'd love to know the timetable of Richard and Grace. Mm -hmm. It it did me the same way, though, because I thought they were making progress. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, oh, no, you did that to be mean. (laughs) It felt like like it. It definitely felt like it. Especially after looking at the scar in her hand. Yeah. And then you're like, hey. Yeah. It's just, it's hurtful. Yeah. Yeah. Later, she knocks on the kid's door again, but Aiden ignores her. And when she tries the knob, the door is locked. She tells him through the door that she's going to make something to eat if he's hungry. But despite her calling out to him repeatedly, he does not answer her. We see her eating a sandwich alone in the dining room, unable to keep her eyes off of the painting of Mary. She moves to the other side of the table, keeping her back to the painting as she continues to eat. When this still isn't enough, she takes the painting down from the wall. Afterwards, she turns off all the lights on the first floor and goes upstairs to take a shower. She comes out, still naked, to find the word mom written in the steam of the mirror with the heart around it. She wipes the sentiment away, but in the blurry reflection of the mirror, she sees Aiden standing in the doorway watching her. He stays there for a moment before finally walking away. First of all, that again, boundaries. Yeah. Yeah. Number one. Number two, he wrote that fresh, didn't he? Yeah. So what? there's too many questions to be asked in this moment. Yeah. And none of them get asked in this moment or after until like way later. Yeah, no, that's true. I think that with what just happened with Mia and now this, it's like, oh, you guys are like the word hazing comes to mind. Like you guys are are bullying me like you're I I think it's just uh, him standing in the door. Not that part. Yeah, that's that's a separate issue. (laughs) What's what's happening? That is an issue. When we see Aiden again, he's in his bed wide awake. Grace opens the door and he immediately closes his eyes to feign sleep. She's fully dressed now and looking over the supposedly sleeping children, but her eye is drawn to a shrine. The doll that she saved from the ice is set up on a shelf with candles lit next to it. Grace blows them out. We see the cross on the wall before checking in on Grady in his bed downstairs. When he hears the creaking of floorboards overhead, he whines and barks. We get still quiet shots of the upstairs before a jarring light comes on and Grace plays discordant notes on an organ. She walks stiffly into the kids' room where Mia and Aiden sleep in a bed together. But when we see them again, it's only one person in the bed and they are motionless and shrouded in a silk purple cloth. Suddenly, Grace opens her eyes, panting from her nightmare. She wakes up on the floor next to her bed, and when she gets up, she finds the drawer of the dresser pulled open and her carefully hidden Christmas presents gone. She finds them in her suitcase underneath the bed. Next to the gifts is Mia's doll. Mia knocks on the door telling Grace that she can't find her doll. This is a lot at once. Uh, firstly, the tragedy of her still dealing with this trauma, obviously. Yeah. Having these nightmares all these years later, which we don't know exactly how many years, Mm -hmm. but this is lifelong trauma. Yeah. And so, again, this is something that is not as deftly handled and detailed as you would hope for. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they really just, dabble is the best word, as you said. Yeah. Yeah. 
And to what you're saying with the trauma, I can't imagine that the stress of this situation coupled with crosses and religious paintings in fucking every room. I can't imagine that that's not triggering. Yeah. And the whole thing with the Christmas presents. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's sad enough uh, and it shows her character of trying to create this bridge for all of them. Yeah. Bringing these Christmas presents for them. But then oddly, the way that they're found, it's not like they were found and just taken. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They were found and stashed with the doll. Yeah. Representing their mother. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's a lot at once. Yeah. So it, I mean, so at this point, it's safe to say that she's not doing so hot. I'd right. say no. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fair, <laughs> a fair assessment. Yeah. Yes. And honestly, again, still feeling some kind of supernatural thing. Right. Yeah. But downstairs, Grace offers suggestions as Mia searches in the cushions of the couch. When she asks if Mia looked in Richard's room, she says that she never took her in there. Grace clumsily proposes more rooms where the dolls could be, but Mia is adamant that she never took the doll in there. Grace insists on checking the room instead and tells Mia to come with her. Mia follows, and the two look in a cabinet at the end of the hall next to Grady's bed. That's where Grace finds the doll saying that Grady must have thought it was a toy Mia takes her doll and walks away without even a thank you that's that's a lot yeah this is yeah. the second time uh, second time I brought you your doll back I and then let's not forget I remember what was it the Gotham Cafe with Stephen King when he's like I saved your yes! God <laughs> damn life <laughs> she did she saved you from like I just, I don't understand. Yeah, even a, just a thanks or whatever, <laughs> yeah. that's fine. Like, yes. it, yeah, whatever, yeah. yeah. And then leave, but then at least that's, you know. Uh, that's something. Yeah. 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 Grace returns to her room to take more medication. Later, she stands outside, leaving a voicemail for Richard. She says she doesn't understand why his phone isn't ringing when she just had a missed call from him. But she reports that everything is great. She and the kids just watched a movie together and she made them pancakes. She says that she decorated the house for Christmas together and asked for him to call her back, or better yet, to text her. And that was very sad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Obviously, none of this has happened. No. Yeah. But she's still trying to, I don't know, make him feel okay about leaving her. Yeah. You know, it's like, I, I don't know. And the confusion of these phone calls of her being able to receive these missed calls, mm -hmm. but not being able to connect with him. But again, I, I I think that's my thing as Richard. Yeah, yeah. If you're trying to reach this your family mm -hmm. and you can't, you're like, oh well, I guess I'll. That's yeah. what I was like, gonna say. <laughs> what? Everything's fine. Yeah. yeah, go back to work. I'll, yeah. yeah, I'll just assume it's okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Inside, Grace makes another sandwich. Aiden sits nearby at the table, reading a book with his headphones on. She gets his attention and offers to make him one, too, since she's making one for herself. But he tells her that he'll make his own. She goes over to the table and tells him that she thinks they need to have a conversation. Aiden barely looks up from his book before lowering his gaze again. But Grace still talks. She says that things are very uncomfortable between the two of them. And she just wants to know what she can do to make it better. Or she'd like to know exactly what Aiden's problem is. He looks up at her and shrugs her off with hormones. What? Yeah, I swear. what a fucking <laughs> asshole. She's being like, she's trying yeah. so hard. Gonna make you a sandwich. Yeah, yeah. have what a conversation. Can, what can I Put do to make this better? Yeah. yeah, I and that is true. She's putting the onus on herself. Yes. Yeah, instead of it being like, I, and it isn't anything I can do better. It's you need to stop acting like this. Yeah, yeah. and you gotta stop doing that other thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Grace tells him that she just wants him to know that she's here if he wants to talk to her about anything. But Aiden snaps at her, asking why he would want to talk to her. Grace tells him that they're stuck in a house together, and Aiden scoffs at this. Grace backtracks, saying that she didn't mean stuck. She just meant that they're in the house together. She wants to be in the house with him, but she thinks things would be better if they could just talk to each other. Aiden tells her that he doesn't want to talk to her. Grace is like, okay, great. You won't talk to me, but you'll watch me in the shower. Which <laughs> I mean. But yeah, again, Bags. like we said, she's trying to fix it. Yeah. You're mm -hmm. continuing to put up a fucking fight. And 
She's not even. She didn't even say that at first. She no. waited until the end mm-hmm. to bring up what happened because she's frustrated. Yeah. <laughs> and I again for her, this is where I'm feeling all of my sympathy. Yeah. Uh, here, yeah, I'm like, dude, you've got to budge some. Yeah. You've got to something after everything that she's done and attempted. Yeah. yeah. Aiden looks down in shame, but Grace continues to prod. She asks if he really doesn't have anything to say to her when all she's trying to do is make things better. Later, Mia and Grace sit on the couch watching The Thing. First, fantastic, right? Yeah. yeah. I, I think that it's such an interesting film to choose. Feelings of isolation in mm-hmm. the cold. It's like, it's perfect. Yeah. yeah. And it's, a, it's just a perfect film. Absolutely. Aiden surprises her by coming in and offering her a mug of something to drink. I'm sorry, dude. <laughs> <laughs> just from our last interaction alone. Yeah. I... I, you couldn't pay me to drink this poison. Yeah, <laughs> dude. I, yeah, on the cool. I get, right. I get that for sure. But I don't think. I mean, obviously, these kids don't like me. Yeah, I don't think that this fucking kid. Oh, he at least spit in it, dude. He probably spit in it. I, I would, <laughs> I would assume that. <laughs> yeah, but if she, I would assume that. If she's trying <laughs> to get them to turn around. <laughs> And Mia's watching the movie with her. True. Yeah, Maybe yeah. he's seen and she's and like, okay, cool. You are warming up or something. It's an olive branch. It's an apo- <laughs> yeah, it's an apology. I would, I, this is, I don't know. I, w- I want to believe this. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I would be like, what's in here? Yeah. But I mean, <laughs> they're here. Like she said, they're stuck there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And she's trying to make the best of it. I look, I commend her for because this is just a mug of piss, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I'm this is my thinking, especially the conversation that we had last. Yeah. But again, with sometimes you'll say something and it's like, fuck, she's right. You know, maybe she got through to him. Maybe, like you said, he sees his sister and he's like, okay, I'll fucking try. But no, I, I, it's safe to operate under the assumption that there is a spit or piss. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and why is there not a mug for anybody else? He's like, I only had enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I only drank X amount of water. <laughs> it's, I, you know, I want to trust these kids. Yeah. I do. Yeah. But Grace asks if the drink is for her. And when Aiden says yes, she takes it gratefully with a big smile. And this is sad. She does not think that way at all. No. She's so optimistic and like, oh, like we can watch a movie together, which is obviously what she wants because that's what she lied to Richard about them doing. Mm-hmm. But Mia suddenly starts to cough and say that she's really cold. Grace offers to make her hot chocolate, and when she presses her hand against Mia's forehead, she says that she feels fine. One last thing about that mug. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's something that I've thought of for a long time, is that if anyone was trying to poison me, I would accept the poison so graciously, just in case there was a little bit of like a conscience in them mm-hmm. to where I was really overly happy to have this, that they're like, oh, I poisoned it. I'm so sorry. <laughs> sorry. You know, just hopefully. And maybe that's also what she's doing, that she's like, if I smile really big, he'll have to tell me if he that poisoned, he poisoned She She doesn't think that he poisoned her. She's or a good soul. Or beat in her drink. Or you can do like <laughs> Princess Bride and just like slowly take the poison your whole life so that you build up immunity So to she's it. been drinking pee. Yeah. And she's- <laughs> <laughs> look here's the thing i i think i think what it is is i i i would have said um seeing that mia is cold mm-hmm. i would have given her that drink and gone and make myself one he's like, no, like uh, he's like no grace don't <laughs> that's <for you."> <laughs> <laughs> so that's how you know yeah yeah i mean you gotta think outside the box <laughs> you gotta protect your neck <laughs> yeah <dude. laughs> But Aiden asks Mia if she wants him to go get the gas heater, and she says yes. On the TV, the thing twists the dog into a horrifying, unrecognizable creature. As Childs blasts it with his flamethrower, the flame lights on the gas heater. Grace shields her nose in her sweater against the smell of the hissing heater, and she asks if it's safe to have it on in the house. Aiden assures her that it's fine. It always sounds like that. This is okay. First of all, it doesn't feel safe at all. Yeah. No, I was like, is that safe? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and she's covering her nose from the gas fumes. Right. There's a fire lit in the fireplace. Oh, that's yeah. True. Get that's closer, what... Mia. Kaboom. Yeah. <laughs> oh, shit, you're right. I didn't think about that part. I, well, I was just thinking about warmth. 
Yeah. yeah. You don't need this heater if there's a fire in the fireplace right now. Go yeah. towards it. That's true. <laughs> Go towards <laughs> it. But also, I didn't think about the fumes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Rich is going to come home to a smoking crater. <laughs> if he comes home at all. But. Yeah, that's true. On the TV, as Copper's defibrillators burst through Norris's chest, the painting topples over, clattering to the ground. Grace asks if they want to watch a different movie. (laughs) (laughs) Suddenly, they're watching Jack Frost. No, not that Jack Frost. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Grace has fallen asleep in her chair as the movie starts to give way to static. When Grace wakes up, she is asleep outside in the snow. We zoom out and she is very small on the cold ground, nearly swallowed up by the darkness of the night. She wipes the snow away from the ice and sees the tiny red hat of the doll disappearing into the depths below. Suddenly, she is falling through the ice. A hand thrusts up from the depths and she screams, bubbles pouring from her mouth into the freezing water. The hand pulls her feet, dragging her in deeper, and we see that it's her father. So again, just haunted. Yeah. So tragic. Only makes you feel more sympathy for Grace. Yeah, like yeah. what, you know, what? what's going on? What else happened? Yeah, a box has been opened. Mm-hmm. Um, also, in an interview, Riley Keough said that on the outside scenes, the directors would have her go lay in the snow before they started <laughs> filming. Why? So that she would be fr- freezing. <laughs> well, I mean, you can just, act like you're freezing. Yeah. yeah. Remember, um, well, this is a bad example, but LL Cool J and Deep Blue Sea. <laughs> <laughs> That was a very bad example. With the teeth chattering? Yeah. <laughs> so, like, the director's like, no, colder. Yeah. Colder. <laughs> um, <laughs> I will say I did read an interview uh, where they were talking about filming these scenes and they had told the producers, they were like, well, we're going to have, you know, these scenes of breaking through the ice. Mm-hmm. And the producers were like, oh, okay, well, we can film those in like a pool or something. And they're like, no, we're filming them in the lake on location. Yeah. And so to my understanding, they did. Jeez. So it's like, you know, I understand realism and I respect it and the actors for being willing to do it. Yeah. yeah. But at the same time, it's like, again, protect your neck. Yeah. Literally. <laughs> Grace wakes up for real on the floor next to the couch where Mia is asleep. She grabs her phone off the chair and finds that it's dead. She unplugs the charger and tries the light switch. Nothing. Grace opens the curtains to find wind blowing loudly and snow swirling around outside. She tries to get a glass of water. The faucet gives her nothing. She wakes up Aiden on the couch, telling him that the power's out and the pipes are frozen. She asks to check the generator, but half asleep, Aiden just asks what time it is. Grace admits that she doesn't know because her phone is dead, and she tells him to check his. It's dead, too. She notices that the gas heater is gone and asks if he moved it. Confused, Aiden says no. This is when Grace realizes that all of the decorations she put up over the fireplace are gone. She asks him if this is some kind of joke, but Aiden just stands there at a loss for words. Mia calls her from the kitchen where she's opened the fridge and found it to be completely empty. Grace once again accuses them of playing a joke on her, but the kids don't even respond. She tells them that she's going upstairs to her room, and when she comes back down, all the food is going to be back in the fridge, and all the decorations will be back up. On her way to the stairs, she sees the Mary painting. It's back up on the wall. Once in her bedroom, she tries to take some of her medication, but her bag of pills is gone. She checks the drawers where she had put her clothes away. They're all empty. So if I'm Grace, all right, th- this is this is day two mm-hmm. of him being gone. He had said two days, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I'm a little worried we might starve and freeze and die and everything. Mm-hmm. But he'll be back. But he'll be back. Yeah. As he claimed. Right, right. So this is, again, when I'm starting to be like, what the fuck? Yeah. yeah. And I don't know if I'm getting, if, if me watching the movie, I'm getting a little pissed off, obviously, at the character of Richard. But I'm also a little bit about uh, the screenwriting. Right. Because I'm a little confused for Grace to not be asking certain questions. Right. Yeah. 
Like even with the dream, I when she because she woke up, I was like, "So is that real?" Or what? I was like, "What happened? What is this? What does any of that mean?" And I literally, I thought she did wake up on the lake. I yeah, did too. Yeah. So I mean, the and it's starting to be dreams. Are they dreams? Are they hallucinations? Are they? Yeah. yeah. You know, and so it's uh, difficult. But again, I and she did check her phone and everything. Yeah. Doesn't work. But even so, if I'm there, there comes a point where I'm starting to get pissed off at Richard. Yeah. absolutely oh yeah because if you haven't you haven't been in contact with me for two days mm-hmm. and where the you know i'm sorry as richard i'm i'm playing both parts <laughs> <laughs> this evening both parts of me <laughs> <laughs> but if i'm richard again if i haven't talked to grace in two days mm-hmm. we're at the lodge yeah. yeah i don't care about work yeah like that's fucking wild. Well, mm-hmm. again, and you showed us it's that easy to be like, look, I can't come. Yeah. yeah. And his associate or whatever was like, okay, like, I don't know. I just can't. I, I hate him. I hate <laughs> well, him. Yeah. And I know that, and we'll get to it obviously, but there is a line that tries to understand, you know, explain. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But even so, not buying it. No. But when Grace leaves the room, Aiden and Mia are coming up the stairs. She confronts them, demanding to know where her things are and telling them sincerely that she needs her pills. She accuses them of taking them, despite them both vowing that they didn't do anything. They didn't take anything. Grace points out that there is no one else in the house that could have, but Aiden suggests that she take a look at herself. She's the one walking around the house all night long. Grace is confused by this, but Aiden tells her that they hear her walking around every single night. Grace isn't buying this and assures them that she'll find her things, starting by searching their room. And this is where I want to come in the screenwriting. Yeah. Because if we look at it, everything has been set up in such a way with her having these visions of the past already Mm -hmm. and her kind of waking up a little oddly compared to how she fell asleep. Yeah. And this distrust between her and the kids. So everything is converging in this feeling of just uncertainty Mm -hmm. and mistrust. Yeah. 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 But it's all been planted and everything that you feel, this confusion is earned. Yeah. True. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's a, you take the good, take the bad. Yeah. (laughs) She goes into their room and checks the shelves, under the bed, under the covers. She doesn't find anything. Mia asks her to stop, saying that they haven't hid anything, but everyone stops when Grace looks upon the little shrine that Mia had set up. Now it hits home for Mia, and she asks where her doll is. Yeah, fuck my medication. Like, the important (laughs) thing is your doll, right? Well, Cynthia's gone. We gotta find (laughs) her. Not Cynthia. (laughs) Her hair was a little... (laughs) Later, alone in her bedroom and standing in front of the bed that she's clearly searched, Grace hears Mia call out for Grady downstairs. We see Grady's empty bed. Grace comes and asks where he is, and Mia proposes that maybe he's outside. Everyone goes out into the snowstorm, bundled up and screaming for Grady. Grace even ventures all the way out onto the ice, shouting for her beloved dog, but no one finds him. Later, after Grace warms herself by the fire, the three stand talking in the kitchen. When they come to the realization that the generator isn't working, Grace asks how far the nearest town is. Aiden says it's miles away, and in this storm without a car, it's pointless to even try. He guesses that the roads will be closed for days. We next see them sitting at the table, eating bowls of canned beans with saltines. The Mary painting is on the wall behind Aiden and Mia, and they eat in silence until Mia announces that she's done and walks off with her bowl. With her gone, Aiden tells Grace in a conspiratorial tone that he didn't want to say anything in front of his sister, but he had a weird dream last night. Actually, it was a nightmare. He says that in the dream, the gas heater started smoking and none of them could breathe and they eventually suffocated. Go to your room. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah why would you say that <laughs> that's just scary dude yeah. i can't handle that right now i don't know why and i oh it's it's terrifying because it puts that thought in your head and you're like oh oh yeah, yeah. dude <laughs> and then, i'm not the one to be doing yeah and this. then waking up and everything's gone and the heater's gone yes mm-hmm. and i'm sorry but as grace it's like oh yeah back when i asked a child if something was safe or not <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah that's right i asked children if uh, the fire code was proper or whatever it's like really 
Well, I mean, <laughs> I guess we got to assume that it's there. They come here all the time, so they do use it, and they would know. And that's but what it, he said. It, but it is still their children. It doesn't feel yeah. yeah. safe. You're covering your nose because you're inhaling yeah. gas yeah. fumes. That's supposed to be <laughs> outside. <laughs> no, she's like, does this smell like piss in here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or is it just this mug? <laughs> <laughs> only, it only happens when I hold the mug <laughs> when I'm about to take a drink that it smells, <laughs> smells like a bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> but we cut to grace standing at the window watching the snow blow by later she crumbles crackers into her bowl of beans and looks over at the clock which tells us that it is now january 9th this is just the sight of it yeah frightening i mean in disbelief she checks another clock which gives the same date she quietly adjusts it until it reads December 22nd. So that's what pisses me off even more about Richard. Mm -hmm. He said to his children, the yeah. 25th, and he's been gone for two days. Unless yeah. he said he was leaving and coming back the 25th. Oh, that's not kosher, yeah, dude. <laughs> but okay, <laughs> then let's take the vacation on the 25th. Exactly. Or the 26th or whatever. But even, even if... Even if you said you were going to leave for a couple of days and come back the 25th. That's still five days. Yeah. yeah. You've still been yeah. gone for a couple of days and it's the 22nd. At or it's some, supposed to be. At yeah. some point, you're a fucking liar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's just what it is. But Grace takes a bowl of food outside for Grady and sets it down in the snow. She whistles for him, but Grady is still nowhere to be seen. When she goes back in, Aiden is sitting on the couch looking at the fire. She asks him if he messed with the clocks and he tells her no. She hears Mia upstairs talking. And despite Aiden calling after her to stay, Grace walks up to their room slowly. Mia is having a full conversation with someone, giggling and letting them know that she's been playing with Aiden a lot. Grace busts in, saying that Mia's phone is working now. But Mia insists that it isn't. Grace wrestles it from her. She tries to turn it on, but finds that Mia was telling the truth. Mia admits that she was just pretending to talk on the phone because she really misses her dad. Grace offers no apologies and silently hands the phone back. I'm like, you didn't slip the bottom out with like an alien pinky or something, did you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that in a movie once. <laughs> I, I, I feel bad for both of them in this moment. Yeah. yeah. Because you're like, oh, she's scared too. Mm-hmm. Later, Mia pours hot water in the sink to take a hoe bath. As the steam rises, <laughs> wow, dude, she is. As the steam rises to the window, the word "repent" is revealed to be written on the glass. In all fairness, this is when I am beginning to have some concerns. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, of the predicament that they all find themselves in. Yeah, but I remember a certain research scene. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know and yeah yeah so i, I feel so she's not the only one with knowledge of yeah yeah feeling yeah. a little weird here mm -hmm. in the dollhouse the family is still slumped over and the sea monkeys are dead we see the painting of mary and hear a small voice singing a hymn as she lays in bed that night grace hears the singing and the voice of her father telling her to repent she gets out of bed and goes over to the other side of the room and takes something down. As she locks it in the dresser drawer, Mia lets herself in and tells Grace that she heard a voice. Grace goes out into the hallway with Mia, taking the flashlight from her and leading the way. They creep slowly towards the stairs, but behind them, a door bursts open on its own. When Grace goes inside to investigate, she finds the window open and chalks it up to the wind. As she gets close to it, though, she looks outside and finds a field of snow angels. Back in her bed, her father's voice implores her to repent her sins. She thinks of the locked gun safe, and we see her hands pulling it down from the shelf and punching in the combination. Firstly, the visual of the snow angels. Mm. Yes. I bet if you counted. Mm right yeah you're probably right this is the kind of stuff that i love yeah okay these images it's honestly frightening to see that mm -hmm. and see the way they kind of go over the hill in the snow yeah. yeah it's like this is uh this is beyond my experience <laughs> <laughs> but the gun yeah yeah see i uh, that for me this is what was just confusing because so 
the earlier when she had the dream and she woke up outside, mm-hmm. I was like, so did that really happen? And you made these in your sleepwalk? Yeah. Did you? I was like, I don't. Did they do this? Did some? I was like, I don't understand. Who did this shit? Well, you're getting a lot of narratives presented to you. Yeah. To where you don't, you're starting to feel like grace where you don't know what's real. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, that is a good question. You're telling me I'm wandering around at night. Yeah. Yeah. I woke up in a lake, I thought. Yeah. yeah. You know, so what's real? I don't know. But her father's voice says that God is waiting. Near my God to thee plays loudly as Grace follows the trembling beam of her flashlight back up the stairs. She moves through the hallway like a shadow, poising herself outside of the kid's bedroom. When she quietly opens the door, the music stops. Inside the room, Grace finds someone in one of the beds. They lie motionless on their back, draped in a silk purple shroud. She pulls the shroud away and finds Aiden, duct tape over his mouth with the word repent written across it. Now Aiden wakes to find Grace standing in a trance over his bed. He calls her name and tries to wake her. Mia gets out of bed and the two shake her, trying to rouse her from her dreamlike state. But Grace backhands Mia and Mia falls to the ground. Aiden goes to comfort his sister, who is now bleeding from the head, and Grace continues to stand, dazed with the gun still in her hand. She turns her attention toward the window, and we see her framed against the white snow. She stares, and when we see the ticking clock, the date reads January 9th. So, again, this is this feeling of what is real? Yeah. What part is actually happening? Uh, this visual that has haunted her her entire life. Yeah. She's seeing represented with these children. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She's waking up holding a gun. Like it's, I mean, it's, uh, we got to where's Richard? Yeah. Yeah. Because this is day three. Yeah. 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 And it's just a lot. in the fact that her medication's gone, mm-hmm. like it's only making everything worse. Mm-hmm. And like y'all said, it adds to like, what is actually happening? But later, Grace is in the kitchen, packing the meager remains of canned food into a bag. Aiden asks what she's doing, and she tells him that they're leaving. She needs her medication, and they have to get out of here. She tells him to go and pack his things, but Aiden is adamant that they can't leave. Grace tells him it's not up for discussion, but Aiden tells her to just look outside. It's crazy to try to leave now, and they don't even have their jackets. He puts his foot down. They're not going. That's fine with Grace. She pushes past him, telling him that she'll just go alone. He tells her that she won't make it, but Grace isn't trying to hear it. She opens the door and treks out into the white, infinite snow. Mia joins Aiden, and they call her name, but they finally just let her go. Is it because Krampus is out there? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) He was hopping from house to house. We saw him. (laughs) Don't go out there. Yeah, probably get the kids first. Yeah, honestly. Yeah, Yeah. you know? I mean. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. (laughs) We're following Grace. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Wrapped in a blanket, Grace trudges through the cold. The ground is an endless yawn of untouched white snow. But in the distance, she sees a house. The house is shaped like a cross. She closes the distance. And when she approaches the weathered home, there appears to be someone standing in the window. She kicks at the door and screams for the person inside, but no one answers her. And she collapses and sobs on the ground. The wind picks up, whipping the snow around her as she gasps for air, crying and panicking as she pulls a water bottle out of her bag, frozen solid. She continues, her journey marked by a trail of footprints marring the pristine snow behind her, but she stops when she notices that there are suddenly tracks in front of her. Immediately hopeful, she picks up her pace but comes to an abrupt stop, her face contorting as she begins to cry when she realizes that the tracks are only leading her back to the lodge. They're her own. That sucked. Oh, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I was like, man, I just went in a circle. And this surreal feeling. Yeah. That other lodge shaped like a cross. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, what do y'all think about that? That, I think, is lending itself more to hallucination. Yeah. And who was in the window? Was that her father? I think so. You don't see clearly, but I I think so, too. Maybe it was a break. It was like, I can't take this shit. Yeah. Well, the stress of everything. Yeah. And clearly she got turned around. Again, unless, and we'll talk later, but unless there's something supernatural happening, Mm -hmm. she did get turned around and follow her own 
prints back to her house. Mm-hmm. Right. Her nose bleeding, she falls to the ground and sees a bit of a red flower poking out from the snow. She pulls it out and digs beneath, revealing a framed photo. Belongings that disappeared from inside the house are buried out here in the snow. Aiden comes outside and calls out to Grace, and she looks up at him with sorrow, blood smeared beneath her nose. So it's like when Bart ruined Christmas, right? Yes. (laughs) Just like it. There's still some snow left under the car. (laughs) Inside, she sits on the bed, flexing her frozen fingers. Aiden comes in with the frame that Grace found, but now that it's cleared of snow, we see that it's a memorial frame. But the photo inside is not of Laura, but of Aiden and Mia. He asks her what this is, and she tells him sincerely that she doesn't know. Aiden pleads to her, saying that they're stuck here and confused. What does the picture mean? Grace says again that she doesn't know, but Aiden addresses the elephant in the room. What if we died? That's the first thing you go to? <laughs> well, he already, I mean, he planted the seed of his nightmare. Yeah. I, I know, but that... I mean, it's a, it's a big leap. It yeah. is. <laughs> but this picture's not good. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can all agree. <laughs> Grace denies this, and when he pushes her, she snaps at him weakly. She tells him that it makes no sense. She's sitting here and talking. She's hungry. Her feet are cold. But Aiden proposes that maybe that's what death is like. They wouldn't even know if they died. Grace lowers her head, tears streaming down her face. That night, a low and dreamy voice echoes to Grace that they must confess their sins. In the dollhouse... The boy doll hangs from his neck in the upstairs hallway. Uh, this I was like, is what? A lot. Yeah. And isn't this back at home? Yeah. Yes. So but they were playing with it right before they left. Mm-hmm. Just throwing that out there. And one thing I will say along with that is that for the first time, the voice saying repent your sins and everything. Yeah. yeah. The first time ever. It doesn't sound as clear. No, yeah. it doesn't. It sounds like... It's uh, like echoey. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like something is, uh, you know. You know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know. In her bedroom, Grace slowly raises the cross and puts it back on the wall. Dark and ominous music plays as she looks up at it and we hear her father ask if she would like to pray. She turns her head in the direction of his voice and he repeats for her to repent her sins because God is waiting. Later, we see Grace's reflection in the upstairs window as we slowly pan out from the house. We see the cross-shaped cabin with someone's shape still in the window. Aaron tells us that God reminds us that he is so impatient, he can't wait to see our smiling faces today and tomorrow. He promises that when everyone wakes up, God will get to see their smile. They get to be God's family now. As we see shots of the bleak cabin, he continues that it's time to open the door and you and you alone hold the key and you know how to open the door. We cut to Grace sitting outside in the snow the next morning. Inside, Aiden and Mia are huddled together, praying desperately in hushed tones. Grace comes over and pulls out what they're praying over. It is a printout of a news report announcing the tragic deaths of Grace Marshall, Mia Hall, and Aiden Hall, who passed away due to a defective gas heater on December 22nd. This, uh, you know what, kid? Maybe you're right. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe you are exactly right. I would check this for spelling errors, maybe. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> but I think I think we got I think we're on to something. Yeah. <laughs> Back to this extra extra Todd smell. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or maybe there's like an app thing at the bottom, it's like newspaper yeah. <laughs> <laughs> com or something, but we need to check this out. Grace asks where they got it and if they made it, but Aiden shakes as he tells her that they need to repent their sins now so that they can go to heaven. Grace pleads with him to stop, but he keeps repeating himself, cautioning that they need to repent. They need to atone. Grace becomes more and more desperate, screaming in Aiden's face to stop and shaking him. Finally, she tells him to shut the fuck up. Aiden gets to his feet and the two wrestle before he finally tells her that he'll prove it. He dashes out of the room with Mia right behind him. Grace doesn't follow. Instead, she looks out of the window at the endless whiteness surrounding the lodge. 
She buries her face in her hands and tries to catch her breath before promptly burning the death notice in the fire. As she watches it burn, Mia frantically calls her name from upstairs. And so Grace runs right up the stairs where she is confronted with the sight of Aiden hanging by his neck, his feet swinging back and forth. He looks up at her, telling her, can't she see? They can't die because they're already dead and stuck in purgatory. He tells her again that they need to confess and repent their sins so that they can go to heaven. So again, I'm confused. Did you guys really die in that heater fire? Heater fire. <laughs> <laughs> well, what happened? Or the I, gas or whatever yeah, happened? I honestly, at this point, whenever she runs up those stairs, yeah. she sees him like this. Yeah, yeah. I gasped. Yeah. Because holy I'm like, cool, yeah. holy <laughs> shit. And then when he raises his head, I'm like, holy yeah. shit. Well, because he said, I'll prove it. Yeah. yeah. He, he did. And he did. I look, dude. You're right. You were right about the obituary. Yeah. You were right about the picture in the in the snow. Yeah. What do we do now, though? Yeah, but like, get down. Yeah. yeah. Talk to me <laughs> on the couch. Yeah. <laughs> Grace stares up at this, her eyes wide and full of fear. Aiden screams at her to confess and repent her sins, but she just walks away. We see her whispering prayers beneath the painting of Mary. She asks for the Holy Mother to protect her as she sobs. Aaron's voice echoes in her mind as she finally breaks, ripping the painting from the wall and demanding to know why she left her. She runs outside and we see the still attic as Aaron's calm voice says again to repent and confess. God is waiting. His words ring out from a boom box perched on the windowsill and a harness lies discarded on the floor. So there are a lot of mixed feelings here mm -hmm. because part of me is very very glad that it isn't something supernatural yeah it makes it more interesting to me that it is something that is going on on this earthly plane yeah yeah but at the same time i am so fucking pissed off oh yeah oh no yeah <laughs> yeah at these kids that was my first feeling was when i get home I want to fuck you up <laughs> like that, like that. I I wasn't expecting a fuck them kids movie. Yeah, but the, I mean, oh my god! And this is what I was trying to allude to without giving it away earlier. But when you have doors swinging open on their own, mm -hmm. it feels like I, again you didn't get out of the cock a duty car. <laughs> I know that we were doing the misdirection thing. I'm not mad at that. They said that they had the cinematographer not shoot anyone at eye level. Mm -hmm. Everything is a little below or a little above to like kind of give the impression that it's another presence watching them. Oh. That's subliminal. That's making us feel that way without doing opening doors where now there's no reason for that door to have creaked open on its own. Mm -hmm. You know, that just shit like that and the dog too growling at nothing but like maybe it wasn't nothing but like again it it just feels kind of cheap to, and like you're planting these seeds to later be like no nah, you thought it was a ghost yeah. i will say the first door cannot be excused right right the no. door where they were both up there you're like well aiden could have done something yes yeah, yeah. yeah. they could have rigged something uh he's like i didn't rig shit yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um but i can't refuse that reference no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um but the first one there really is nothing that can be said and it is a little uh it is a uh, cheap yeah it is. and speaking of rig the hanging oh yeah it still bothers me mm -hmm. um because i don't i didn't remember the the harness thing the, yeah, uh, being on the ground me either so to me i felt like it was never explained how the fuck he did that even with it being explained, it looked too it looked too good. We saw all of him. Yeah. Well, Aiden used to work as a stunt boy. <laughs> <laughs> he was a stunt boy coordinator. <laughs> well, he was two. <laughs> <laughs> he was two coordinators. That should have been established then. <laughs> yeah, probably. Well, there's a lot of things that should have been established. <laughs> um, <laughs> but again, uh, even with the planning of this trip, they I don't I feel like the planning of this scheme mm -hmm. it would take more time than they had they, yeah they got to work man like <laughs> and what again 
what gets me is it's not even like we're in this and it got out of control. Right. We were just going to prank her and fuck with her a little bit. But we like it, we yes and at each other. And now I'm pretending like I'm hanging from the rafters. Mm-hmm. They planned this. Yeah. This was the yeah. original plan. It's in the dollhouse. Yeah. I was going to say the dollhouse was them planning it the whole fucking this. time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's wild. Yeah. That's wild. Is this a comment on like uh, kids with the pranks and the YouTube and stuff? The YouTube? <laughs> yeah, T. Yeah, granddad. It might yeah. be. It's getting out of hand. <laughs> this is some repugnant shit. <laughs> <laughs> it really is though. Yeah. But Grace shuffles on her knees in the snow, making a circle and whispering to the Lord to help her. Aiden and Mia watch out the window as Grace walks slowly back toward the house, cradling Grady. Mia immediately begins to cry for Grady and runs off, ignoring Aiden when he tries to stop her. Grace sits on the porch, stroking her dog, who is frozen solid. So this is what also infuriates me about these kids. Mm -hmm. Her face when you saw her as you're hanging in the attic, that wasn't too far. Yeah. That wasn't far enough. It had to be some it had to be this. This is where you realize, oh, well, maybe that was a little too much. (laughs) Really? It's been too far. It's been too far. You took her medication. That is that is the that is the point of no return. Yeah, I think that right there. You don't (laughs) fuck with that. No. Uh. Like, and I understand that they're both kids and maybe you don't understand the gravity of the situation, but Jaden Martell is old enough. (laughs) (laughs) That's true. I'm sorry. You're Uh, old enough. Yeah. Yeah. The kids know, oh, I take this medication medicine when i'm sick and it makes me feel better you know what medicine is yeah like i mean a child knows that a three-year-old knows that i just that anything from then on is unforgivable Mm -hmm. you just don't you don't do that (laughs) yeah mia sits next to grace sobbing as she confesses that it's all her fault because she left the door open she apologizes to grace again and again begging her to come inside because it's too cold out here but grace has clocked out which I don't know what else you could have expected. Yeah. yeah. You've convinced her that she's dead. Yeah. That yeah. all three of you are dead. I, and again, when, what, like, this feels so much like the, the end of the film. Yeah. And then this weird, like, epilogue where it's like, <laughs> ooh, maybe. We fucked up, <laughs> dude. Um, but that is something that they mentioned um, that. In the original screenplay, it kind of ends after you figure out the twist. I want from here maybe five, ten more minutes. Okay. Because I feel like there has to be some kind of... uh, Fallout resolution. I was looking for the word fallout. Yeah. uh, With what they've done. Right. But I just feel like maybe I was mistaken, but I feel like there's like 20 minutes left. No, there's yeah, quite, there's a bit. Like that. There's a bit. So it was kind of surprising to me that I was like, you know, and you know what? I got to give them some credit because it is very interesting to reveal a twist and then live in that twist. Yeah. yeah. So that's interesting too. Inside, the last sea monkey floats down to the bottom of the jar, dead. <laughs> what was the point of that? I don't. Yeah. I don't know. Why did you even bring them here? And the dollhouse is still at their dad's house. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you left them you left some of them in the jar in the dollhouse yeah to die to die. <laughs> <laughs> these kids are terrible <laughs> aiden and mia sit in bed and aiden whispers to his sister admitting that he doesn't know what to do mia tells him that grace is going to freeze to death and aiden agrees saying that they need to stop this Using flashlights, the two go over to the wall. They remove planks to reveal where they hid all the supplies, belongings, and Christmas decorations. Mia tells Aiden to get Grace's pills. I had to pause the movie because hmm. I was going to punch the TV. <laughs> I was like, you all did that. All of this shit. Everything. I mean, I know we already knew that, but then to see like you guys. The stash. Yeah, you took everything. All our food is gone. And the coordination. Yeah. yeah. And you know they were eating in there after Grace. Oh, oh yeah. 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 Fucking asshole. Does Richard know his kids are evil scoundrels? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Richard knows a lot. Yeah. I'll be honest. <laughs> but Grace still sits holding her dog on the porch. Aiden and Mia come out and wrap a blanket around her. They try to convince her to come inside, telling her that it's too cold out here. But Grace doesn't respond to them at all. 
Aiden finally admits to her that they were just pretending. No one died. Grace finally turns toward him as he admits that he didn't hang himself. None of it was real, but they've pushed her too far. She only says that they're all sinners on this earth and the Lord needs to forgive them so they can be welcome in the kingdom of heaven. She begins to pray as the snow continues to fall on the ground until it cuts to black. Inside, Mia holds a flashlight for Aiden as he tries to start the generator. It won't. He says that they need power because the charger's out. He tells Mia to give him her phone, but she says that it's dead. She talked on the phone too much with their dad. This is bothersome. Yeah. Because in what world is he not asking to talk to Grace? Yeah. I'm just mad. I I didn't understand that either because I thought the same thing. If I called and I'm like, okay, Ari, what's grace doing or whatever and she's like oh no No, she's fine yeah she's cool (laughs) no 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 no. go put her on the phone yes the first time that that she was like no i can't do that that i i need to come home and like immediately compounded with the fact that grace is not answering her phone yeah Uh, it only makes him look even worse as a character he sucks because there it's just the logic of that there as a human being yeah it just doesn't even make any sense yeah Aiden is visibly frustrated. And later, with Grace still on the porch outside, the children sit in their room, wondering if they should just give her another sleeping pill. So that was, it wasn't piss. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) At least there's that. But Uh, even that, you're (laughs) fucking drugging this lady. Yeah, Yeah, dude. (laughs) Again, these kids, why aren't they in the conversation more for like the worst? Horror kids? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, They really, they really, really should be. People talk about the kids from The Witch. What about these kids? Yeah. Yeah. And you know what? I want to apologize to the kids from The Visit. (laughs) Because this is okay. rap. <laughs> they didn't do this shit. No, they did not. Well, they're just rapping. Well, yeah. well, the, so the they're, kid. they're about even. Yeah. I'd say. <laughs> when they hear the door close, they get up and go to the living room where Grace has placed burning logs in front of the lit fireplace. They watch in horror as she slowly lowers her knees down onto the logs. She cries out in pain and slumps to the ground and the kids scatter. Grace gathers herself together, telling God that she needs to repent for the harm she's brought this family. She brings her knees back onto the glowing logs, whispering repentance for her lies, fornication, and impurity. At any point, they can stop this. Yeah. This is a physical activity that they can pull her off of these logs. True. And they're like, let's go to bed. They're like, what? (laughs) Are you kidding me? Scram. Yeah. (laughs) We'll see you later. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But see, this is what doesn't work for me. I got to hurt myself to show that I love you. I don't want to do that. Yeah, that's. I don't um, don't want to do that. That's the thing. It is the cult. Yeah. Yeah. Aiden and Mia cower upstairs as Grace lets loose blood curdling screams Aiden holds his sister and drapes a sheet over them, but it doesn't drown out Grace's cries. Outside, we pull away from the isolated darkness of the lodge. In the brightness of Richard's house, he sees what the kids had made in the dollhouse before they left. The girl, the boy, and the woman slumped down in the living room. A boy hanging from his neck above the stairs with the word repent written in red on the wall. I... He's been home for three days. Yeah. <laughs> and he has like, it's just fucking infuriating. That's wild. Yeah. What but, if he didn't go on work? He's just been sitting at home that whole time. <laughs> oh, <laughs> dude. I swear to God. He's just scratching and eating. <laughs> but why is he looking at this like, huh? Yeah. They know what they know from your research. Mm -hmm. You know what that word means. Yeah. (sighs) What is this? (laughs) Like, how are you not in a full blown panic? But he just stares at it before leaving the house. 
On the way to the car, he tries to call Grace, but has to leave a message telling her that he called all day yesterday and no one will answer him. <laughs> Dude, so you're telling me that you're calling and you're like, oh, well. Yeah, he's pretty calm. It's unbelievable. You're in the house looking at fucking dollhouse. Yeah. <laughs> he was going in there to play is what yeah. it is. And he's like, well, this is strange. I better. <laughs> I should probably get back to the lodge. Yeah. I never get to play with this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're always playing with it. <laughs> but he says that he's on his way it's still gonna take five or six hours if the roads are open but he hopes they're okay he says for them to call when they get the message and we travel with richard down the roads to the lodge so again a full day with no contact mm -hmm. you've had mia which is questionable that you wouldn't ask for grace yeah yes but now it's been a full day with no contact mm -hmm. And you're just at home? Yeah, just chilling. <laughs> <laughs> like, I just can't believe this. As a human being. Well, the with, game was on. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> he's like, it was Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just, again, as a human being with a family and a partner? Yeah. You, neither of these things. Yeah, you suck, dude. If I could get out of work so I can hang out with your sister and the kids, uh -huh. I'll get out of work so that I can. <laughs> he's like, no, better go yeah. in. Yeah. yeah. And then lounge about the house. Yeah. <laughs> and the assistant made it easy. Yeah. yeah. I just can't yeah. believe this guy. But Aiden wakes up in the attic and sees Mia standing by the stairs. She tells him that she has to go to the bathroom, but he advises her to just go in the corner because they can't go down there. He whispers. He's like, just use a mug, dude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy. I tried it. <laughs> but he whispers at her again to stop, but she doesn't listen. Cradling her doll, Mia slowly descends the stairs and tiptoes toward the bathroom. On the road, Richard gets behind a snowplow. So it's like this, like, who's going to get there first? You know? <laughs> After using the bathroom, Mia slowly opens the door and peeks out into the hall. Did he hire that snowplow? He, he like <laughs> snapped at him. He's like, yeah, right there. Yeah, I noticed that too. <laughs> this he road. was like, yeah, go down this way. And the dude goes. He's like, you got it. Yeah. You got it, boss. <laughs> it's just weird. You yeah. could have been here when. <laughs> yeah, dude. Oh, I hate this guy. Viscerally. Yeah. <laughs> Mia goes slow, but the floorboards still creak behind her as she creeps back toward the stairs. But... As she's looking in front of her, she doesn't see Grace step out from the shadows behind her. Grace softly calls her name and Mia screams, dropping her doll as she runs away. Grace picks it up. Mia runs up to the attic and hides behind her brother, but Grace walks in slowly, the doll in one hand and the gun in the other. She tells them in a calm voice that they don't have to be afraid because there's nothing to be scared of. Aiden uses his body to shield Mia as she sobs. This is scary. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. But again, a part of me is just like, y'all fucked around. Yeah. And now you're about to find out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I thought of that quote from King of the Hill, and <laughs> I don't know if there's a God or a heaven, <laughs> but I know one thing for sure these kids are going to hell. <laughs> these kids are going to hell. Uh, <laughs> I just I I want <laughs> I I feel like everything that we've watched Grace experience. Yeah. It's just firstly it's tragic as hell uh -huh. to see that this is the end result of their chicanery. Yeah. <laughs> but it's also like just unbelievable. <laughs> Jeez. I don't think I don't think I've heard that word since Better Call Saul. <laughs> Who says that? Well, I'm an old man, as, you, <laughs> as you've determined. Uh, but again, I, I just, I, they set the kids up with such a sympathetic arc uh -huh. and then just tore it away. Yeah. yeah. Because I feel nothing for these kids. Yeah. No. Even though they're terrified. Right. They did this. They did. <laughs> it, it's, that. that's what I'm saying. It may, it, it makes me not care for any of the characters. Yeah. yeah. I care it's about like, Grace. I feel bad yeah, for Grace. That's all for me. Yeah. yeah I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Hey, again, I don't know what happened with Richard, Richard and his relationship with their mom. But from what the hints she said and from what we got earlier, I'm just to take it that. She did break up this family at some or well, something. Well, he, he broke up the family. She well, was on no, some, no, no, no. Yes, some yes, lemon square right, bullshit, yeah. but he broke up the family. Right. 
I so I'm <laughs> <laughs> just just throwing it out there. But it, it does. It's like, man. So everybody's has a little fault here. I and it's it's tough. Yeah. It's tough. And again, Richard, <laughs> like I don't even know what this character yeah. is <laughs> because I was yeah. say especially these kids, but especially <laughs> <Yeah>. Richard. <laughs> well, we don't really know anything about him, and the interactions we've gotten with them are kind of shitty, and he seems really dumb. No, he sucks. Man. I mean, his his decision making is not, yeah. not the greatest. And I think, and that's my thing is that are you is that the character you're trying to create? I can I mean, or is that just an easier character to write all of this around? Mm. Yeah, you know, because it's like the character you've created is fucking horrible, terrible. Yeah. Is that the Richard that we are supposed to see, or yeah, is that okay. just you know, yeah. yeah, it makes the film logic work better, right? It's a good question. Grace settles down in front of them, reminding them that they're already dead. Aiden tells her again that they never died; they were only pretending. And Mia admits that they did it for their mother. Her face frostbitten. Grace ignores this, telling them that Christ suffered in the flesh, so they need to release themselves from earthly sins. She tells Mia that she needs to sacrifice something for the Lord. She tells Mia that she needs to burn her doll, and Mia protests, sobbing. Mia, if you don't light that fucking doll up, I'm yeah. sorry. Like, <laughs> I understand what it represents. That's You got to let that go right now. Yeah. Well, you have another one at home was yeah there was yeah. yeah so i mean let's yeah. let go of this one for for safety yeah, yeah. For safety. i mean <laughs> yeah grace doubles down that they need to get rid of false idols and sets fire to the doll it begins to burn and mia lunges for it grace tosses it on the ground and aiden quickly smothers the flames with a blanket he comforts his sister, but Grace is still cool as a cucumber. She assures them that everything is going to be okay and that she'll show them. That's when she pulls out the gun. Richard pulls up outside just as Aiden and Mia scream at her to stop. He's like, hello, the only. <laughs> Wait, so you're telling me that this was six hours? Of this? <laughs> yeah. God damn. Maybe I do feel a little bad for these kids. That's unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> It doesn't seem like six hours have passed. No, no not at all. Yeah. <laughs> at all. He walks in the house and calls out for Grace, but finds the living room empty. He sets his bag down and stops when he sees poor Grady set in his dog bed, still frozen. Richard rushes for the stairs, still calling out for Grace. She comes out, still holding the gun in her hand, Aiden and Mia cowering behind her. He tries to speak to her calmly, but Grace whispers to him that God is punishing them for what they did. Richard says that they didn't do anything. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> I understand what he's trying to do. Yeah. But I every word out of yes. this dude. <laughs> Grace begins to cry as she cocks the gun. Richard whispers at her to please not do this, but she assures him that it's okay as she points the gun at her head. She tells him sadly that he doesn't understand because she's already dead. He pleads with her again not to do it, but she's convinced. She explains that she needs to exit this vehicle and endure the tortures of purgatory. Richard moves toward her slowly, telling her that she's not dead and there is no purgatory. But she tells him that she'll show him, which she learned from this fucker over here. Yeah. Aiden, I forgot his name. I'm just mad yeah. for the rest of this. That little piece of shit. <laughs> she pulls the trigger and the gun clicks dryly. Everyone winces in horror as Grace cries, telling Richard that she told him. He asks her to give him the gun, and she says that he's still not listening. She cocks the gun again and points it at him. He holds her arm, speaking to her softly, but she says again that he doesn't get it. She pulls the trigger, and Mia screams as Richard falls backwards down the stairs. This, okay, the bleakness is off the charts. Mm -hmm. And you just want Richard to stand up with an arrested development moment and be like, and that's why yeah. you, nah. you, <laughs> you don't, don't prank. Yeah. <laughs> because this is so just. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but how does this not wake her up? Like, he's dead. Hmm. That's yeah. not, he's not getting up. Well, he wasn't part of this. 
he, so he's, he's not in now. purgatory. Yeah, I'm confused. Yeah, he's here now with us. If we're dead, how the hell did you get here? I think I don't. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Is what I think. Yeah. <laughs> but it just for me at that moment, I'm like, holy shit! She shot this dude. Yeah. yeah. But she, two seconds ago, you're like, I'm dead. Let me show you. Okay, but if you're dead, you shouldn't be interacting with me this way. And then when she shoots him, it's like, you see he's not getting up. This isn't purgatory. Then where are you? Even if you were, yeah, wouldn't I, you be like, oh, shit, I just shot the man that I love. This is hell or this is what this isn't purgatory. What the fuck is this? I, you made me think of the end of Tales from the Hood. <laughs> <laughs> well, right, though? Uh, Every time something like that happens, honestly, you're like, oh, no, I'm yeah. somewhere else. This is else. what it is, yeah. But then when you think of purgatory, I'm stuck somewhere where nothing's happening. Uh-huh. I can run in a circle. I'll never get out of it. Doesn't matter. Or if I try to go in a straight line, I'm going to come right back where I started. Back to the lodge. Which, again, everything has been leading to that conclusion. Yeah. So far. Right. Until this. Yes. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but Mia and Aiden run to their father. They cry over him when they find him dead, sprawled on the stairs. Mia is hysterical, but Aiden snaps into action and pulls her away. They run. Grace goes down to Richard's body and calls his name softly. We hear the engine struggle outside before the car finally starts, and we hear Aiden and Mia drive away. The gun's still in her hand. Grace walks outside. Everything is quiet because the engine cut out. Mia screams at Aiden to start it, and we hear the engine struggling to turn over. At a slow and steady Michael Myers pace, Grace walks up to the vehicle, which is cemented in the snow. She stands in front of it. Inside, there's a streak of blood where Richard was killed on the stairs. There is a trail where his body was dragged, and we hear Grace praying, instructing Aiden and Mia to join her in hoping God forgive Richard and welcome him into heaven so that they can be reunited for eternity. We see them at the dining table. Grace sits across from Aiden and Mia, and Richard is propped up at the head of the table. With her head bowed, Grace begins to sing, Nearer my God to thee. With the broken painting of Mary propped back up behind them, Aiden and Mia cry quietly into their bowls of cold beans. Mia's roughed up doll lies on the table in front of her. When Grace looks at them, they join in singing with trembling voices. And I'd be fucked because I do not know the lyrics to this. I would <laughs> I'd be like, do you want me to drop a beat? <laughs> <laughs> well, or vocalize in the background? <laughs> well, time out because if you've been fucking listening to her father sing it for about That's a week. <laughs> oh, yeah. I've like, like, uh, learned it. Lip syncing yeah. it at the, yeah. <laughs> the whole time it's playing at night. So you can guess what's next. Yeah. yeah you're well, like, oh, yeah, I do know this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We see the kids again as we hear duct tape rip and Mia closes her eyes, sobbing. Aiden assures her that it's okay, but Grace walks into frame, wearing duct tape over her mouth with the word sin written across it. She puts a matching piece over Mia's mouth, then Aiden's. She places a comforting hand on the tops of each of their heads, and we get one last shot of the gun, cold and metal against the white lace tablecloth before it cuts to black, and the credits roll. So, what did you guys think of the lodge? That ending was uh I don't know. I don't think I I, I liked it too much. I thinking more of it, it's like I don't I think it almost for me, I, I did I did enjoy like you said, T, and I think that that's what saved a lot of the movie for me is the performances and how how good everything looks. Mm -hmm. I think for me, there's just too many of the story to where it's like, why did you make that decision? Or why did that happen? Or why it's just like, what? And I think that, that it's hard. It's hard to get into it when there is certain things. It's like, what? Uh, like him taking off for work when he knew that the kid, you don't, you've never brought this lady into their lives for them to properly meet them. Mm -mm. You know what I mean? I know we joked about it and er, everything earlier, but it, it it's like your sister said, it is a process. And if it's been this time, why, why, ha why do you keep still hiding her from your kids and then trying to like one day be like, look, this is all going to change overnight. And this is just what it is. And it's like, dude, 
maybe still and even that your kids are dealing with some heavy shit dude Mm -hmm. it's like take that into consideration yeah i understand that as as adults and parents where we do want to do things for ourselves but your kids like that's your kids need you around some shit like that um and those kids oh man what the (laughs) fuck (laughs) like for real it's like dude and and just like you said i felt bad for a while and then afterwards it was like oh dude y'all are little monsters dude what the fuck I don't understand what like is like you and like you said too at so, at a certain point you're like oh I don't feel bad at all what's going on yeah and I think the thing for me as well is that their poor mother that was like we did good it's like no you didn't <laughs> yeah no yeah well, no uh, you fucking didn't and, and how long has that been going on then <laughs> yeah did it start after this you know the 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 thing with their mom did it has it been going on before is it like what. It's it's just hard for me again. There's a lot of missing pieces here. Mm-hmm. Were these kids this way already, or is this them acting out? Is this because a lot of it is like very well, perfectly executed, and it's like holy shit, how'd you do that? That's the thing is, it is very hard for me to believe that they went from nothing to orchestrating this. Yeah, <laughs> I've, I'm look. I love my kids to death. <laughs> I give them six months to plan out. Scare me. <laughs> when I come home, find a way to scare me. I love my kids. You're not going to, th- no. so you're not going to perfectly do that. I wouldn't. But yeah, I was going to say. Well, at first, we need a yeah. harness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, what? Well, I know both kids. As soon as they take up, they were like, no, 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 give me down. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, no, no. Fuck yeah, this. Like, uh, no, you were right. Like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it does do what. What it does do, it does do good. But I do feel like a lot of, I guess, the story or, you know what I mean? Like you said, the screenplay is just, it did not, it didn't hit for me on some things and it hurt. It hurt it a lot for me. But there is a lot of cool things. The 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 confusion of the dreams and all that was really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the thinking there's a supernatural element helped it. And then again, once you get to it, it's like, oh, well what it's like how did that how'd that happen oh all right i guess i mean i guess the kids did it um but i mean it's i i i will say this and i i I know we still got to do ratings and all that but i listened to the angry joe movie review podcast and he and it was him and two other guys and i apologize for not remembering their names but i remember angry joe because i've watched a few of his videos they said it best and i'm i know it sounds a little harsh but they said that someone, when they asked after the theater, they asked somebody and they said, somebody put it perfectly. This is a great movie to watch once and that's it. It's a good thing to sit there and be like, oh, okay, that, you know, after that, I don't think I need to rewatch this movie again. I don't think that I need to see it again. You know what I mean? I, I don't mean it that in a, in a, you know what I mean? I, I just, there are certain movies that's like, okay, I seen it the once. Um, that's good. I'm cool. I don't need to rewatch it again. It, but again, I'm not one for being a bleak bitch. So <laughs> it's not, it is a lot of, oh my God, God damn. Okay, what's that? Holy shit, dude, what? <laughs> and then, okay, what's happening now? Oh, what? It was you little fuckers. So it's like, uh, you know what I mean? There's mm-hmm. just a lot that did, I don't want to say worked against it for me, but what what did, what negative I do have for the movie did hurt it for me. I think for me, it's 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 very difficult because it's difficult to assess. It's difficult to rate mm-hmm. because there is the things that worked worked really well. Yeah, the atmosphere, the cinematography. Mm-hmm. There is an odd coziness to this film, maybe because of the snow in the lodge. You know, okay. it feels oddly comforting in a way. Mm-hmm. And so for me, I mean, there's part of that that it's like, oh, that's a vibe to return to. Yeah. But I, I'm not going to make it a holiday staple. I know that. Yeah. No. I'm not going to probably watch it uh, unless we cover it on the show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Again? Oh, wait yeah. a minute. No. <laughs> I'll, I, I think I might I might revisit this in some time. I, I just think that it. I just got so irritated mm-hmm. at the, I don't know if it's intentional characterization of Richard. Yeah. Or if it's just, we have to write him this way so everything else can happen. Yeah. You know? I I just I don't know and I and I have to admit I I have mixed feelings about the ending as well. Yeah. I like this imagery 
reoccurring through the film Mm -hmm. and then reappearing at the end. Mm -hmm. That's very fascinating. And it is a very dark and bleak image to see. Yeah. And there is a part of me that enjoys that kind of shit. Yeah. And sees something so dark that you're like, holy shit. Yeah. Yeah. There is something I like about that. But at the same time, it's like this poor woman. Yeah. Yeah. Grace has, this is, you know, and her intentions and what happens. Mm -hmm. It's like, God damn. Yeah. It's really bleak. Yeah. And I, I like bleak, but, um, you just feel so bad for Grace. Yeah. It's, you know, a lot of shit's going on. Yeah. (laughs) And I will say again, you know, it does have the things that I usually gravitate for towards subject wise. Mm-hmm. I enjoy cult horror. I enjoy uh, oddly religious horror. Okay. But uh, there's just like a lot with the way that the story unfolds that just does not ring true as far as logic is concerned. Yeah. And believability. But there's so much about it that is good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's really, really difficult. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree. It's kind of a mixed bag in a lot of ways. Um, part of me just feels like there is missed opportunity with some of the stuff that like the cans of worms that they opened mm-hmm. and then like did not let free, I guess. <laughs> um, I said, I think off mic before we started that there the themes here the ground is so fertile and i just feel like nothing really got planted fair um religious trauma is so real and such a big concept to tackle and i feel like it's almost used as like a footnote yeah it's just something that these kids were able to exploit and the same thing with the cult angle it's just something horrible that happened to her that the kids can exploit to make her lose her grip on sanity. And these children, their grief. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because it goes, I mean, it, it's very raw and upsetting. And then it quickly goes to, we're going to get this bitch. Yeah. yeah. And I don't understand the shift. And maybe that's because, like you were saying earlier, we don't get to know these kids. We don't know if there are behavioral issues or if they have some weird kill bill vendetta whenever somebody pisses them off. Yeah. I don't I <laughs> I don't understand. I don't get that. And that it does hurt it for me when you are kind of dipping your toes into these themes that I am so deeply interested in, but it just feels like you're using them as a vehicle to do something else. Mm -hmm. And it's like, Oh, it's a ghost. Nah, you're stupid. You thought it was a ghost. Yeah. But you just, you swung that (laughs) door open. No. Yeah. Like I didn't imagine that you (laughs) did that. And what's bothersome is you take that one door out. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing misdirection. Everything can be explained. Yeah. So, I mean, I know that it's probably nitpicky, but it's like you, you, you've done something in some ways that is so thought provoking and interesting, but it's kind of like watered down when you do shit like that. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm sorry. There's no way that those children did that trick with the fucking rope. There's no (laughs) way. There's no way. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) All right. Hey, Kids, kids can can <laughs> pretend to be confident really good, but you do some scary shit. They're gonna be like, "All right, give me down, give me down." <laughs> Nay, I just want to remind you, me and JP did not write this. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. We watched it just as you did. <laughs> that part really made me mad. It, it, and I forgot a lot of this movie, but that's the one thing I remembered because I was like, "There's no, yeah. there's no way." Um, it's really frustrating. I think that uh, Richard is a fucking waste of a character. Jesus. Um, there is no likability, nothing redeeming. You can't even be like, well, he really loves his kids. He's a great. No, everything. It feels self-serving there. It, the, his only motivation is for himself. Yeah. When the beginning of this film is an unimaginable loss for his children. He's still worried about number one and yeah. that's it. <laughs> Um, it, it's it's he's fucking frustrating, and I know that he's like almost barely in this, mm-hmm. but 
just <laughs> the fact that he's a character that I know exists in this universe, I'm still mad at him even when I don't <laughs> see him. Because where the fuck are you, dude? Yeah. That's... Um, just it's it's very frustrating. So I spent a lot of this movie just mad. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's where I'm arriving. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a really pretty movie. Mm-hmm. And all the performances are really great. Even yeah. the, even we already know that Jaden Martell is very talented from it. But even um, Leah McHugh, yeah, and she's young. Yeah. She did a great job. Um, but you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> and the dog did great. No, but, yeah. <laughs> um, I just it, it it was a frustrating watch, and it makes it just a little bit more complicated because there are aspects that I really do like, but I think it is just something with the execution that does not stick the landing for me. And again, very conflicting on the ending because I don't know if I love the ending, but I love that last shot of the gun. Because we're we're kind of forced into this really horrifyingly realistic tragedy at the beginning that we watch yeah. from start to finish. This, it's like, you already know what's going to happen. We don't need to show it to you. You know what's about to happen to these people. And that's just as scary as seeing it, if not scarier. I love that last shot. I don't know if I like... Richard comes in like groundskeeper Willie in the fucking Trials of Horror <laughs> yeah, and that, just gets killed yeah, immediately. Yeah, well, that's, that's what problem. I was going to say. I, <laughs> yeah. know, I know you said that he came in and he was like, Grace? Right? Yeah. He like slow walks. Yeah. And he's like, Grace? It's, it's like, almost like, uh, why did you even come back? Why yeah. did you have him come back? You know, I just, I, I don't know. That does not work for me at all. Him being dragged and propped up at the table creepy yeah would have liked it better if he was laying down with the shroud over him but you know okay. it's it's stuff like that where it's like are you like you know what story you're telling mm -hmm. that's honestly very fair and take you it know, all the way yeah. you know what honestly it might have even worked better on a fade out instead of the gun of the sheets being pulled over the kids heads Oh, or that, that okay. oh my god, yeah. that probably would have made my stomach hurt. But that's scary. <laughs> but it it <laughs> does scary. call back to the trauma she went through yes, as yes. a twelve year old. So, so I, you know, there, it's just so mixed. Yeah, yeah, it's like you were so close, <laughs> and I don't know how to score. You were almost there. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how to score that. Yeah. But we have to. So I'm going to lead us into ratings. <laughs> Um, again, I don't even, my score for this could be different tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to give what I came to the table with because I'm confused. <laughs> 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 As I'm unpacking my feelings, there's a lot of anger there. There's yeah. a lot of frustration. Really? Um, <laughs> 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 but, um, I do like a lot of aspects of it. This is not a bad movie. Mm -mm. Uh, and it's, it's wild how many people, I see saying that it's like a masterpiece. Yeah. And how many people are saying that it is garbage? It's polarizing. It's very polarizing. Uh, but I I don't think that this is, I don't think it's bad at all. Um, I did the first time. I didn't care for it the first time I watched it. But I don't think that this is a bad film. I think that this is a good film. I think that for me, it misses the mark. And I really fucking hate Richard. Dude. No. <laughs> <laughs> um. So yeah, I think I think I've kind of already ranted and raved about everything. So I'm just gonna rip off the band aid and say that on a scale from one to ten, cold calculating kids. Yes, I am going to give the lodge. This is hard. <laughs> I'm gonna go with <laughs> six point five out of ten. Cold calculating kids. I'm seeing a lot of nodding in the room with me right now. <laughs> um, I just, again, it is not bad. I don't want anybody to hear this and be like that it's not worth the watch or anything like that because I would definitely say watch it. But there's just something. It's like this should have been a love story. Me and this film, we should have held hands and rode off into the sunset together. And it just, it did not do it for me overall. Um and I'm mad about it. <laughs> but I just, I have to be honest. And I will now open up the floor to you. I think we could tell you were angry. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but I I think that's, I think you you hit the nail on the head. I think that, that that is the only way to or the best way to describe it. 
I didn't like this movie, like I said, the first time. And I think it was just because I had shut off a few things and I was just kind of like watching it on autopilot and watching it for the show. I did like it more. And I was like, oh, okay," And paying attention to it and seeing everything. And I was like, all right. But it is. I think it's that the movie is great. The execution was just not there. And it sucks because I don't like bleak and I got through it and I was in till a certain point and i was like yeah i was like okay cool mm-hmm. and then it hit a, a point and it's like oh, oh okay that this is what we're doing all right and then like i said me not being able to really have a character to identify with you know what i mean it was just kind of like oh this is all tragic and shit's happening but then it sh- it feels like that once the shift happens it's just like oh all right you know what I mean? it's like what's happening here and and like you said, I I think maybe Richard might be in the running now for top worst dad in a horror oh film. Oh my god, he's in the top three for sure. You got yeah, the, the dude from Orphan. Yeah. Oh. oh. Uh, also, technically, Guy Woodhouse. Yes. No. Yep. This might be our top three. Yeah, yeah it might be. <laughs> I was, I was gonna. What does Micah count? He's a husband, but he's not. Mika, or Mika, yeah. He's dog shit. He but is, he's but not he's a father. Not. We have okay. a separate list for. Uh, for yeah, for bad husbands. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I do agree with that. And uh, so, for me, on a scale of one to ten, cold calculating kids, I'm also gonna give the law just six point five. I liked the movie more than watching it the first time. And I did see that too on that same podcast. Like I said, they were like, man, it's the worst movie. I think it's, and it was like this, the movie's no, no it's, it's not, it's not it's that not. bad. Yeah. It's like, I don't think it's that, you know what I mean? It's not that bad. I just feel like everything is good, but the execution, just executing what you wanted to do or what you were trying to do. Just, I felt like felt short. And and again, I'm not one for bleak movies and I this was fine. You know what I mean? But like I said, I think I think you're right. I don't think I'll never watch it again. Mm -hmm. But I think some time needs to pass. You know what I mean? There does need to be some time before it's like, oh, yeah, pop that on again. Uh, Let's wait. You know what I mean? (laughs) Let's wait a minute. And I get that for sure. I think. My thing, I am definitely glad that we watched it again for the show. Yeah. yeah. Because my interpretation of it and my appraisal of it was kind of off. Yeah. That first time. And this time I do see a lot more that I enjoy from it. Mm-hmm. And I I think that it, what it comes down to for me and to not restate everything, it is a great film trapped inside of a good film. Yeah. Okay. Because there is so much here. This atmosphere even you know what the bleakness be bleak yeah Yeah. go as dark as necessary i'm fine with that Mm -hmm. but be logical yeah you can't do that shit with richard (laughs) yeah (laughs) you can't you can't say oh well mia's been in contact with him this entire time but he never once asked for grace yeah you can't do that because it doesn't (laughs) ring true yeah it's not believable and then for these kids to be fucking like Johnny Knoxville level of yeah. <laughs> of pranks. I don't I just, I just can't I can't grasp it. I just can't and then they're fucking using the goddamn dollhouse as like red thread yeah, and shit they, yeah. before they leave and then they're literally they finalizing their plan yeah. before yeah. they leave, but then not knocking the dolls out. Yeah. <laughs> just in case because you know your dad has to go back for work yeah it just is wild he's gonna see this well not only that what's the end game then here you I don't break know. this poor yeah. lady your dad comes back and finds what and then what yeah and then what happens and then you fucking you wrote your own ending dude so so <laughs> yeah so you know? was yeah. that the plan is their dad would come back and be like oh i'm not gonna be with you you you've lost it was that the plan? I don't know. Dude, these kids are worse. Yeah. By the, <laughs> by the second. Yeah, well, what was, what Fuck was the them end? kids. I don't know. Yeah. Because literally, you saw... What do you expect to happen? Yeah. What's what's the goal? Yeah. I can't stand these children. Yeah. It, was, it was only when she was like freezing to death outside with her dog. Yeah. That they were like... Mm, maybe too far. Maybe, yeah. maybe we just drug her again. <laughs> yeah, and they even I, said that. Yeah. yeah. I just I can't God I can't believe it um I but then again even with the ending yeah it's bleak Mm -hmm. but it's kind of it's it it works 
It works. I just um and but it works better with tweaks. Yeah. yeah. And uh, you know, I don't know, man. <sighs> it's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> it is because there's just so many conflicting thoughts. But the thing is, is that the things that work really work. Mm-hmm. They do. And the things that don't work, you know how they could. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's just uh very difficult. But I am glad that we rewatched it. I uh wouldn't uh make it a regular watch. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I think that it's just because of the frustration of it. The yeah. bleakness doesn't bother me. Yeah. I want that. I don't mind it. I just uh, I'm just um I'm I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> But for me, and it's the damn, these themes that are so rich Mm -hmm. and so fertile and just so like, you could deftly and deeply dive into them Mm -hmm. yeah, and they just kind of like graze them a little bit. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know. That is a little upsetting. I will say that. (laughs) (laughs) But for me, out of 10 cold calculating kids, I also came to the table with... (laughs) 6.5 6.5 cold calculating kids out of 10. It is not bad. Yeah, it's not. It just it just could be oh like I want to <laughs> <laughs> I I want to stay in this lodge a little longer but yeah. you know with uh, more, you know. <laughs> I'm tired, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's all from us at Podmortem. What would you rate The Lodge and what should we watch next? Let us know on Twitter at The Podmortem. Be sure to follow us on Instagram and like our Stairhole Productions page on Facebook. Be sure to follow each of us on Twitter at Blood and Smoke, at Real Streeter 84 and at Travis MWH. Please consider pledging to our Patreon and stay tuned until after the music for a special shout out to our Wendigo Getter patrons. And remember, there is a fine line between trickery and torture. If you're foolish enough to cross it, you may just find yourself on thin ice. Until next time. Thank you for staying tuned for a special thank you to our Wendigo Getter patrons. Yeah. yeah. Woo. Oh, yo, I no, we both did it. It was yeah, all right. We got, it, yeah. we got there. We got there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to sing Near My God to Thee or something, but that was fine, too. <laughs> No, <laughs> I, didn't, oh, no. I didn't have enough time to learn this song. <laughs> yeah, I didn't plan a prank. <laughs> <laughs> the special thank you to Chris Ontiveros, Kristen Lofton, Megan Martinez, Kimberly Bass, Sophie Hodson, Anthony Jerome M., Jordan Nash, Kent Morton, Lala Thomas, Travis Anissa Hunter, Miguel Myers ATX, Jennifer Perez, Allison O'Neill, Carissa, TJ and Angie Bronson, Gabrielle Trevino, Spooky Mom, Aplin Ontiveros, Karima Rhodes, Antonio Huerta, Kimberly Kleindienst, Will Brown, Sydney Smith, Osvaldo Soto, Bobby Holmes, Donna Eason, J.D. Rezac, Molly Gerhard, Armand Spasto, Aaron Aguirre, Eggy, William Berry, Brittany Ramatar, Charity Oxner, Amanda Six, Mandy Rainwater, Jordan Roberts, Dylan, Melissa Sierra, Holly Bryan, Jordan Blevins, Liz Heath, Spencer Montavo, Pancake to Panda, John Ramos, Michael Newding, Alexis Roberts, Dan Laveau, Itzy M, Gary Horton, Leisha Olivier, Kate Lamp, Carlos and Sydney, Jessica Hunter, Helena Rudder, Alan Johnston, Mariah, Livy Fun, Mandy M, Scott Troutman Wise, Towton Watson, Mozzie Bear, Brittany G, Dave Burke, Adrian Stakes, Daniel McGinnis, Nick Spill, Emma Hagel Kissinger, Valerie G, Emiliana, Brian Glass, CB, Taylor Santana, Will Lewison, Angelique, Smelly Poo Poo Head, Beth Bauer, Cookie, Esperanza J, Jason Kyle, OKC, Joshua Rumley, Danielle Peralta, Brandon, Nicholas Carter, Sawyer Reese Farr, Dr. Diva Loves Horror, Girl That's Scary, Cassandra, Andrea Simmons, Ashley Higuera, William and Zena Rush, Ryan Brom, Megan Ochoa, Laura Lassiter, Natalie de Guzman, Eileen O, Marissa E, Sydney, Henry F, Megan M, Strangely Sarah, Christy Beck, Nancy and Andy, Amanda Lopez, Andy Terrell, Jason Hanavan, Abigail Spitzer, Katie K, Erica Morin, 
Cameron S., Nicole Stewart, Tris Wynn, K.87, Mariah Jensen, Carrie A., Lonnie Lono, Powell, Kayla E., Maggie H., Fernando Dominguez, Murder Stina, No Thanks Tom Hanks, Kevin McGonigal, Kristen Marcy, Ori81 Boricua, Look Like That One Girl, Bog Boy, Felnez 63, Alita Pui, Probably My Jugs, Kate Thackeray, Wade Pack, A Lizard, Bay J, J Rich, Jen Lassiter, Topher Williams, Elena Mettler, Neil Chesson, Valerie K, Christy Lee Kruger, Professor of Humanities, Laura McCarricker, Naomi, Josh Smith, Autumn Green, Jess L, Heather Santayano, Abby Kopp, Crystal 831, Cassidy Carruthers, Skank Sinatra, Morgan Alexander, Tony Osteen, Julie Fredborg, Rihanna S, Daniel Taylor, Anna Kate, Heather Ortiz, Jen T, Kim H, Dana Cook, August, Vengeance Spirit, Sam J. Green, Kelly Glazy Face Mac, Cindy Palmer, Jenny May, Zoe Marie, and Glittery Fab. Thank you all so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. We love you. We do love you. And I've said it before and I'll say it again. You're all dolls. Again? <laughs> <laughs> they are. <laughs> Happy holidays. Yes. Yeah. We'll see you next year. Until next time.